Hey, what's up? Billiam here. The following video is a three hour retrospective recorded over the course of a year and a half covering the entire main series, Sonic series, up until this point. Enjoy. Mm. Fuck, that's high. Well, it's Sonic's 25th anniversary year, and to celebrate, we're gonna look at every main series Sonic game, starting with Sonic the Hedgehog and ending with whatever game comes out this year. We're gonna witness the evolution, de-evolution, and critique it as objectively as possible. I meant to say we're gonna praise it mindlessly. After Sega launched a company-wide contest to create a mascot that could compete with Mario, Sonic the Hedgehog was born. In an attempt to create a more edgy character to compete with Mario's blue-collar status, Sonic was designed in a much more extreme way, with shoes based on Michael Jackson, a personality based off Bill Clinton, and a bad guy based off of a Teddy Roosevelt caricature. Certainly, the combination for success. The ideas for Sonic's gameplay came about through the repetition of playing World 1-1 of Super Mario Bros. The original Mario Bros. game had no saving ability, so in order to keep playing after a game over, players had to play World 1-1 over and over again. Yuji Naka, the creator of Sonic, stated in a Nintendo Power interview that having to repeat this level became so tedious that he would try to get through it as fast as possible, which birthed the idea of Sonic's gameplay style. Sonic the Hedgehog came out in 1991 for the Sega Genesis, and was an immediate hit. It helped bring an end to Nintendo's essential monopoly over the game market, and nearly instantly became iconic. Through marketing their character as cool, and taking advantage of literally the one technical superiority the Genesis had over the Super Nintendo, Sonic became a huge success. They say he's incredibly fast. Well, what's the hurry, mister? Hmm? And about his attitude. Smarty pants! Oh, what's this one? Oh, this is a Sonic the Hedgehog from Sega Genesis. <laughs> Look at these radical colors, huh? Wow, Sonic's fast, too. However, through the years, we've seen how Sonic has become somewhat of a joke in the gaming community. With insanely serious plot lines, an overly defensive fan base, and too many unnecessary characters, reboots, and spin-off titles. With Sonic's extremity being sort of an out-of-date concept, and his lack of consistent quality titles tarnishing the name, it's hard to remember the series' roots. Sega has tried to recapture that feeling many times, but has yet to have a long enough period of time with only quality games to reclaim this feeling. But in this video, we're going to ignore all the shit that Sonic has put out. We're going to ignore all of that, and look at the game that started a series that began to roll downhill faster than, well, Sonic rolling down a hill. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of the first Sonic the Hedgehog game. Don't get me wrong, I understand its importance and what it introduced and that it's a quality game, but I have no nostalgic connection to it. I had Sonic 3 in Sega Smash Pack 2 for the PC, so I grew up with Sonic 3 and 2. However, I didn't really get to play Sonic the Hedgehog until I got Sonic Mega Collection. In fact, the first time I ever beat the first Sonic the Hedgehog game was on the iPhone with the Christian Whitehead port. What I've started to notice after playing for a while is that the game has a very unique way of challenging the player. The first level, Green Hill Zone, affords you the ability to play with Sonic's speed. There's a lot of open space to run and a lot of opportunity to explore his abilities such as the spin attack. If you gain enough momentum and press down, Sonic will roll into a ball and allow you to pummel through enemies. Building up speed feels good, and the sound effects of rings and enemies blowing up is satisfying. However, the game has an interesting way of using this against you. There will be times where there's a spring that will send you flying in the other direction, and unless you know it's there, there's no avoiding it. Immediately as you get into the second level, things change. Green Hill, the first level, was all about running fast and learning to avoid obstacles where Marble Zone is about waiting and patience. Running backfires, so the challenge comes from wanting to go fast. The urge to reclaim the feeling of going fast from the previous stage works against you. The first game actually challenges your patience by making you want to go fast, as opposed to testing your knowledge of the level and reaction time by actually going fast. Now here's the interesting thing about Sonic. Even when you're supposed to speed through a level, you're supposed to have prior knowledge of how the level's laid out beforehand. There's a lot of trial and error involved. The biggest moment that sticks out to me is in Spring Yard Zone. In Spring Yard Zone, there's a lot of moments where you can fall down a pit, roll down, and back up a ramp. You get used to this as all three acts of the level have multiple instances where you can do this. However, in the third act, there's a moment where you think you can do this, as it's actually the very last pit you can fall down, 
but then you find out it's a bottomless pit. The only way you could have seen this coming is if you had prior knowledge of its existence. And there's a lot of moments like this throughout the whole game, and especially in Labyrinth Zone. I jump on an enemy, and my forward momentum lands me on a pit of spikes that I had no prior knowledge of being there. I stand on a platform going up, I get put into spikes. And again. This would be fine in many circumstances of the game, but Labyrinth Zone is underwater and doesn't afford you as much reaction time as normal. Well, here it is, the defense of the negative opinions towards the Sonic series. Now, in order to do this, I'm going to compare the Sonic series to the Mario series. Not because of its similarities, but due to its fundamental differences. The Mario series is all about giving you a challenge by laying out the map ahead of you and giving you all the tools you need in order to conquer. The challenge comes with the precision of controls, predictable patterns, and being able to remember what to do under stress. Mario levels can be longer because it's about being able to learn how to use the tools given to you in order to win. Sonic, on the other hand, doesn't present the same challenge. Sonic is about memorization. Many of Sonic's levels have unfair enemy placement and unseen challenges. Your first run of a Sonic level shouldn't be fast. It should be calculated as much as possible. However, each level is about memorization. If you know where an enemy will show up, you can take action before it has the opportunity to backfire. Sonic levels are short because of this memorization principle. Sonic is a series about trial and error, and Mario is a series about developing your skills. Many who have started with Mario and then discovered Sonic, sees right through Sonic's gimmicks. In a Mario game, you feel good for accomplishing a challenge. In Sonic, you feel good about going through a loop-de-loop -loop because you know you had to maintain top speed to get there. The criticism of the series mainly comes from this. It's easy to see how someone may feel the Sonic series is gimmicky. It has a nice presentation combined with false reward. And if you can see that, it's hard to unsee it. As somebody who grew up with the Sonic series, however, I enjoy this. I know what I'm getting, and I enjoy it. But I have an understanding of the level layouts, and I'm used to this style of gameplay. But we also have to admit that someone might not see this as we do. Alright, let's stop criticizing this game. I do love it, and I'm a huge Sonic fan, even though I criticize it all the time. To be a fan of something, it's not to blindly love it, but it's to understand its flaws so you can see how the series can improve going forward. I criticize Sonic not because I don't like the series, but because I want to see it improve. The game visually is stunning. I'm a big advocate that color palettes and design is far more important than polygon layout. One thing I think Sonic has always had over the Mario series is visuals. Sonic is just so poppy and vibrant, and so is Mario, but for whatever reason, Sonic has always stuck out to me more. There is one thing that I think the first Sonic game has that the rest don't, however. The lack of a spin dash and speed boosts. The spin dash was an ability given to Sonic which allows him to reach his top speed immediately, anywhere, at any time. Speed boosts are objects laid out within a stage that also allow Sonic to reach his top speed immediately. Although they feel great in other Sonic games, the original presents a sense of reward that can't be captured because you earn fast, and speed, and quick. There is no way to instantly gain speed. I said earlier that the Sonic series provides a lot of false reward, but the first Sonic game is the game that comes closest to making this reward genuine. After the success of Sonic the Hedgehog, Sega was looking for a way to capitalize on the character. Sonic 1 became the bundled in game for the Sega Genesis, and Sega of America and Sega of Japan were hand in hand to create the sequel. A new sidekick was added, Miles per hour. However, over time, Miles became known as Tails. Sonic 2 was one of the first Sonic games to have a worldwide release date. Since this was relatively unknown to happen at the time, Sega reps had a hard time coordinating with stores and shipping companies to assure the game was released on time. On November 21st, 1992, a day dubbed Sonic Tuesday, this gimmicky day is part of the reason why so many games, albums, and DVDs are released on Tuesdays now, Sonic 2 launched to critical acclaim. New features include the Spin Dash, a spin dash that can move startling. A move which allows Sonic to charge up to his full speed at any time, anywhere. Two-player. A second player can control Tails during play or during a new two-player versus mode. With awesome new graphics, the new split screen lets two play. Boosters. An in-stage object which will launch Sonic into full speed. A new special stage which allows Sonic to collect one of seven Chaos Emeralds. Ten levels and a fresh new half pipe. And last but not least, the Super Sonic Transformation. A new transformation for Sonic unlocked if a player collects all seven Chaos Emeralds. Super Sonic first appeared in the 1992 game Sonic 2. A similar transformation for Goku first appeared in April 1st, 1991, a full two months before the first Sonic the Hedgehog game was released. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is considered by many to be the best game the series has to offer. But is it all really downhill after the second entry, or has nostalgia blindsided the fan base? I mean... Even the most beautiful valleys are downhill from something.
Immediately after putting in the game, the jump and quality is overwhelming. Usually I wait to talk about visual style of a game until the end, but the visual upgrade is amazing. Although Sonic 1 had an appealing color palette, the saturation in Sonic 2 is boosted up to 11. I guess you can say the reason behind this new vibrancy is that they upgraded Green Hill Zone to Emerald Hill Zone, so essentially vibrant Green Hill Zone. One of the concepts played around with in Sonic 1 was level branching. Essentially, you could play the same level without taking the same path. However, Sonic 2 improves upon this immensely. Not only are there alternate paths to be taken right from the start, but the game also makes it easier to go back and forth between different paths, so several playthroughs of the same level might be all different. Sonic 1 really wanted to make the players feel as if they were going fast. With parallax scrolling and several stage props, it accomplishes this very well. However, Sega really wanted to up the sense of speed for this entry. Right from the beginning, there's new stage sets, including corkscrews and a bunch of those loops from the first game. Heading right on into the second level, Chemical Plant Zone. The levels that really benefit from the branching pathways are the water levels. Instead of being forced like the first game, the water levels in Sonic 2 are kind of unnecessary. And I don't mean that they don't add anything to the game, I mean that if the player knows which pathways to choose and is skillful enough, they can actually avoid the water entirely. Unlike Marble Zone, the second level in Sonic 1, which significantly slows down the gameplay to allow for platforming, Chemical Plant keeps the momentum going while providing some notorious platforming moments. It's impossible to mention Chemical Plant Zone without mentioning speed boosts. The Sonic the Hedgehog fanbase has always been divisive, and it really started with the speed boosts introduced in Sonic 2. My opinion? I don't really have an opinion. Sonic's Spin Dash ability does the exact same thing these boosts do, and that can be used at any time. They're just aesthetically pleasing. Moving on to Aquatic Ruin Zone. It's a water level. And just like Chemical Plant Zone, if you're skilled enough, you can actually avoid going underwater. Now, I am not one to get nauseous over watching movies or playing games, but the parallax scrolling in this level is just too much. See, Sonic is one of the first games to implement a depth technique called parallax. Parallax is when objects at different distances appear to be moving at different speeds. It's actually how astronomers measure the distance between stars. So Sonic utilizes this in order to create a sense of depth between the background and the foreground. In Sonic 2, the game began to get really ambitious with how many different depth planes objects will be placed in. Aquatic Ruin Zone at some points has foreground objects, Sonic's plane of field, and multiple layers of background objects all at once. And when Sonic moves and all the other objects move in accordance with his movements, it really gets disorienting, especially after you're playing for a while. Next, we get to fan favorite level Casino Night Zone. It's fun, it's creative, and it feels good, especially when you get a jackpot and collect a bunch of rings. The casino style zones became a staple of the series after this, so it's always cool to go back and see the series at its roots. Hilltop Zone. Definitely one of the more platform heavy levels in the whole game. After Hilltop Zone comes Alexandria Zone, then Negan Zone, then Point of View Shot while potentially your favorite character is Murdered Zone. There's the weighted jumps you have to time and make. Platforms that will fall if you stay on them too long, and lava that rises at certain points with falling platforms sprinkled throughout. Mystic K Zone is frustrating, yet a fair level. There is a series of breakable platforms and pulleys, so you have to pull the lever first, lowering the platform, jump on a breakable platform, and back onto the lowered one all before it crumbles. All to avoid falling into a pit of spikes. Spikes are everywhere, but that's okay because this level is also littered with the invincibility power-ups. And those power-ups are really needed in this stage. Not only are the spikes scattered in every which way, but a lot of the enemies here are difficult to kill. You have a snake-like enemy which ambushes you and can only be killed by jumping directly on top of his head, and fireflies which can only be killed when they aren't fireflying. But don't worry, the fireflies last a tragically short amount of time. Your fox companion usually makes sure that they don't have any time to develop. Mystic Cave Zone also provides a ton of alternative route options. And in the iPhone port of the game, a whole new level can be accessed through Mystic Cave Zone. However, in the original version, there is just a pit that is impossible to jump out of. And I mean impossible, not just really difficult. This is one of those notorious parts of the game, and it's a pretty big blemish. Sliding on into Oil Ocean Zone, we see that Sonic slides around. There are some green caps that blow off of a flame, and you're never quite sure when it's going to happen, and it happens quick. So you'll try to jump on top of it before it blows, but it will happen mid-jump so you end up hitting the fire every time. Also, this level is filled with too many cinematic moments. Sonic sliding around and going through Donkey Kong cannons, etc. Now we get to Metropolis Zone, the last proper zone. This is probably by far the hardest levels in the whole series. The enemies in the level consist of a mantis, which will throw its arms at you, they're nearly impossible to avoid. A crab with a hammer claw, which is also nearly impossible to avoid. And little star guys, which explode and send pins in a million directions, which are incredibly impossible to avoid. The level is also filled with difficult platforming and some of the most obnoxious pattern recognition in any game ever. Sky Chase Zone, the beginning of the end of the game. 
Sky Chase Zone sees Sonic and Tails flying up to Dr. Robotnik's Wing Fortress. This is one of the most uneasy levels I've ever played, because even though Tails will always be right under Sonic, I'm constantly on edge thinking that Tails will miss me and I'll fall to my death. This takes my focus off of concentrating on avoiding enemies and causes me to... die. The level leads directly into Wing Fortress Zone, a relatively straightforward level except for some perspective platforming that is a little confusing. And finally, we see Death Egg Zone one of the most artificially hard levels in the history of forever. In Death Egg Zone, you have to figure out how to beat two incredibly hard bosses with no rings. Each of these bosses has specific patterns that they attack in, and at times, it's hard to tell when and where it is appropriate to attack them. Throughout the game, most of the bosses are incredibly easy, and at times, you can beat them before you even have an understanding on their attack patterns. And other times, you can quickly pick up on the patterns and just wait for an appropriate time to attack. But here, not only are the patterns highly unpredictable, especially with the first boss, but you have zero rings throughout the level and therefore no opportunity for trial and error or to learn their patterns. The Sonic series has one of the most diverse level selections in any series ever, and Sonic 2 really laid down the groundwork for that. You have the Green Hill Zone clone, the City Zone, Robotnik's base, the Sky level, etc. Sonic 2 has been the standard for the series ever since it came out, and it's deserving of that title. Even the annoying special stage has been copied over a million times. However, once again, like its predecessor, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is not a perfect game. Many of the flaws from the first one still persist into the second one, including the problems with memorization. Especially with the Death Egg Zone, in which you don't have opportunities to memorize it because you don't get any rings within the beginning of a very difficult stage. Sonic 2 is what every Sonic game is based off of after this. Not even just the level variety, either. Sonic is given a new ability, a new character is added, and the feeling of grandiose is built up. Sonic 2 is to the Sonic series as Mario 3 is to the Mario series. Sonic 1 laid the basic groundwork, characters, gameplay, and setting, while Sonic 2 took that and expanded upon it. However, did the series really peak after the second entry? I think it's safe to say yes. Sonic 2 isn't only possibly the best Sonic game, but it also cemented Sonic as a video game icon. Sonic became massive after Sonic 2. In 1993, two different TV shows were based on the character and were airing at the same exact time. Sonic became the first video game character to have a float in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and it even caught the attention of the world's biggest celebrity. One of the most interesting things to come out of his intense popularity was a poll that Sega conducted. The poll asked children to identify cartoon characters, and more kids were able to identify Sonic over Mickey Mouse. It's hard to think about it now, but Sonic was a huge icon at one point, and if it wasn't for this game, that wouldn't have ever been. Even though Sonic the Hedgehog 2 laid the groundwork for the series and set such a high precedent for what was to follow, the next entry might be just as good, and debatably, even better. When the Sega Genesis was released in 1989, its biggest competition was the Nintendo Entertainment System, which was released four years prior. The Sega Genesis had far superior technical aspects to the NES. Genesis does! 16-bit arcade graphics. However, in 1991, when Nintendo released the follow-up to the NES, the Super Nintendo, the Genesis had the technical disadvantage. Despite releasing games like Sonic the Hedgehog to combat Super Nintendo sales, Sega was lagging behind and still had a technical disadvantage. At this point in time, ROM-based cartridges had been the standard storage for games, and had been around since the mid-70s. To put in perspective how much data these cartridges could hold, the audio file for the Sega chant at the beginning of Sonic the Hedgehog Sega took up over one-eighth of the total space on the cartridge. Where the total space of a Genesis ROM cartridge could hold around 4 megabytes, the total capacity of a CD was around 700 megabytes. To regain a competitive edge in the market, Sega developed the Sega CD, an accessory for the Sega Genesis that could play exclusive games, which were capable of displaying full motion video and CD quality audio. Hey! You still don't have a Sega CD? Huh? What are you waiting for, Nintendo to make one? <laughs> you have seen the games. Right? Uh, Wrong uh, answer, man. Show them! However, the Sega CD ultimately did not help boost the sales of the Genesis significantly. The accessory only sold 2.2 million units, and at the end of the console wars, the Super Nintendo had outsold the Genesis by over 15 million units. Even though the Japanese branch of Sega helped with the creation of Sonic the Hedgehog 2, it was largely an American project. 
See, at the time, Sega of Japan was focusing on creating an enhanced port of Sonic the Hedgehog 2 for the Sega CD. Over time, and with a lot of experimentation with the hardware, Sega of Japan ultimately created a different game. In the fall of 1993, Sonic CD was released for the Sega CD. New features include full motion video cutscenes animated by the same team behind Dragon Ball Z, a time traveling mechanic inspired by Back to the Future. Sonic, after hitting a signed post, can run at full speed to travel backwards and forwards in time to alter the game's ending. Sonic's super peel out move, another way for Sonic to reach his top speed. Eight new special stages, which allow the player to collect one of seven time stones, and the introduction of fan favorite characters, Amy Rose and Metal Sonic. Amy's introduction was actually a little messy. In the American version of the game, the manual refers to her as Princess Sally, implying that she's the same character from the Sonic the Hedgehog Saturday morning cartoon. In Sonic the Fighter, she was called Rosie the Rascal. It wasn't until Sonic R that she was finally called Amy. Metal Sonic is the first adversary ever created for Sonic, and early on in the game, Metal Sonic captures Amy, who in this iteration is a very young child. Even though he was barely in the game, Metal Sonic gained a huge fanbase after this and returned in future games. I mentioned how Sonic 2 was a vibrant game, but oh my god, Sonic CD. The prior mentioned time traveling mechanic allows Sonic to travel backwards and forwards in time to destroy a generator or a projection of Metal Sonic in order to achieve a good or a bad ending. So in order to draw a distinctly distinct correlation between good futures and bad futures, these intense vibrant colors are used. Even the music in the game matches the unique color palette perfectly. The original US version of the game had an odd soundtrack. It was sort of an orchestral, slow techno style. It certainly helped with the odd setting, but it distanced itself too much from Sonic. However, the Japanese soundtrack, which is present in the modern iteration of the game, is stunning. It's upbeat, yet somehow different than the other soundtracks in the series and it completely benefits from the CD quality sound. However, one thing that the Japanese version is missing is the Sonic Boom song at the beginning. Actually, maybe not. Even though Sonic CD sets itself apart from other Sonic games immediately with its vibrant color palette, its true unique qualities come from experimenting with the gameplay itself. One of the places I think it pays off the most is during boss battles. Usually, robotic boss battles are methodical and simple, but here, each boss battle is completely unique and has a creative challenge. One takes place underwater. Robotnik uses air bubbles, which Sonic needs to breathe as a shield. One of my favorites has Sonic running on a treadmill in order to create friction to heat up and destroy the bottom of Dr. Robotnik's safe place. Even the face-off with Metal Sonic is unique. Instead of being a direct fight with him, Sonic has to race him to the end of Stardust Speedway, while avoiding Metal Sonic's and Dr. Robotnik's attacks. It's cool to see that even the most built-up boss battle in the game is experimental, especially when compared to the other two Robot Sonic fights in the classic series. Other Sonic games will often allow you to build up speed and then experience almost cinematic-like moments where you can pretty much sit back and watch Sonic go. However, Sonic CD relies much less on Sonic's speed, which is weird because it's the only classic game which has has mechanics that require you to go fast. In order to time travel, Sonic has to travel at his top speed. Probably why he was given the super peel out move, but a lot of the stages don't provide enough space to easily move to his top speed. Which is fine, I'm of the mindset that the only true factor speed plays in a Sonic game is a reward for your knowledge of a level, but here it's a necessary mechanic. On the subject of the time travel mechanic, is it neat? Yes, it certainly adds a sense of depth to the game, but the problem is that I don't care about it. And to be honest, this is a problem that translates, for me, to a lot of Sonic games. Why should I collect all the Chaos Emeralds in Sonic 1, so I get a different end card? Even in Sonic 2, I especially hate the special stages in that game. And to be honest, I think the novelty of playing of Super Sonic wears off quite quickly. So many Sonic games want me to be invested in getting that slightly different ending but I just don't think it's worth it. Sonic CD requires that you time travel and traverse the level to find and destroy a generator, as well as to complete the special stages to earn the time stones to get a good ending to the game. The special stages are annoying as hell. Like most early Sonic special stages, they are in a pseudo 3D environment, which creates an indistinct depth of field that causes confusion. I get that you need to do this in order to complete the game correctly, but I experience the same levels for the most part. If I don't like specific avoidable mechanics of the game and my reward is minimal, why would I bother? 
Despite the time travel mechanics not adding anything to my personal experience with the game, I can appreciate the effort and quality the game strives for. Sonic games often experiment with new gameplay mechanics and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but when the effort is seen, an enjoyable experience can be found. Even with games like Sonic Unleashed and Sonic Lost World, entries that I have a very lukewarm feeling towards, I still have moments of enjoyment because I understand that Sega allowed the development team to put in their full effort, and therefore I'm going to put in my full effort to attempt to enjoy it. But it's when you see games like Sonic 06 where Sega didn't allow the development team to put in their full effort that I don't want to put my full effort into enjoying it. If you're not going to give me 100%, I'm not going to give 100% into your product. Sonic CD is definitely an odd entry into the series. However, it's clearly one of the most visually striking and uniquely designed Sonic games ever. In fact, I mentioned how Sonic 2 has become the standard for all Sonic games since its release, with levels being derived from the game's level selection. I'd really like to see a modern Sonic game with color palettes and level ideas derived from Sonic CD, because I think it will lend itself to quite a unique experience. After Sonic 2's massive success and the failure of the Sega CD, Sega of Japan began work on Sonic 3, with one goal to make a game that was bigger and better than the American produced Sonic 2. Sonic 3 saw the return of the original Sonic team, who planned to create a huge game with one massive storyline. Sonic 2 had the focus of two player gameplay, but Sonic 3 would focus on 3D gameplay mechanics. In order to expand upon the franchise further, a new character was added, Knuckles. Knuckles was the second rival to Sonic. Originally designed as a mole with a Nike logo on his chest, his character eventually turned into an echidna. His ability to dig in the crescent moon on his chest are reminiscent of this. Sonic 3 was set to be a massive game with a very long development cycle. However, Sega of America was actually able to secure a toy promotional line at McDonald's in order to promote the game. They're at McDonald's in the $1.99 Sonic 3 Hamburger Happy Meal. Sonic launches with a push of a button. Tails flies who knows how high. And Robotnik barely dodges disaster. There's even this sweepstakes thing. Because of the cost of memory storage on cartridges and the promotion, it was decided that Sonic 3 would be released in two separate parts. On February 2nd, 1994, three months before the Japanese version, Sonic 3 was released in North America. New features include the ability to save your game progress, a boss battle for every act of the game, being able to control Tails' flying ability, along with a second player being able to lift Sonic, Sonic now has an instant shield while jumping, elemental shields allow the players to breathe underwater, magnetically collect rings and protect the player from fire. While playing as Sonic, the elemental shields give him different abilities. He can bounce, dash forward while jumping, and perform a double jump, and a new special stage to recollect the Chaos Emeralds. And hey, it doesn't suck this time. Finally, a soundtrack composed by Leon Kampowski. For years, fans speculated that Michael Jackson actually had his hand in the production for music in Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Michael Jackson was on record as being a big Sega and Sonic the Hedgehog fan and even had his own game on the Sega Genesis. And whenever he would take guest appearances on TV shows, he would often not be credited with his real name. Now, as for why fans speculated why he didn't take credit in the game, it either had to do with Sega not being comfortable about his sexual abuse allegations at the time and not wanting to credit him, or Michael Jackson not being confident with the music that was able to come out of the Sega Genesis sound chip. Now, after years and years of speculating, fans comparing rhythms in Sonic the Hedgehog 3's music to Michael Jackson's songs, it was finally confirmed in January of this year that Michael Jackson indeed had his hand in the production of music for Sonic the Hedgehog 3. The story of Sonic 3 begins right after the ending of Sonic 2. Sonic and Tails investigate an island after collecting all seven Chaos Emeralds. Then Knuckles happens, he steals the Chaos Emeralds, he chuckles, and Sonic just watches and the game begins. I'm gonna be honest, out of all the classic Sonic games, Sonic 3 is the worst visually. Since 3D was supposed to be the theme for Sonic 3, Sega tried to cram in as much detail into all the set pieces and character models as possible. Now, as nice as this endeavor was, it took the flat and sleek design from Sonic 2 and made everything look more bubbly and cutesy. Angel Island Zone being the first level sets the stage for the rest of the game. Instead of being about building up speed, Sonic 3 attempts to heighten the sense of adventure. There's swinging vines, secret passages, and a special stage. On top of that, the game's cinematic moments aren't there to make you feel like you're going fast, but they're there to add to the adventure in the story. You falsely encounter the first boss halfway through Act 1, and it sets fire to the stage. The rest of the act is the island burning. After you beat the boss, instead of the screen going black and starting Act 2, the screen transitions to the right and it continues right on ahead. 
Act 2 continues with the stage on fire, but it also plays around with the tropical island theme. There's a large waterfall in the middle of the act, so there's tons of little ponds everywhere, slowing you down if you fall into them. Afterwards, you run past a jet that's letting out bombs. <laughs> Tails, <y> you okay? <laughs> you okay there, little buddy? Alright, just say something if you need me. After that, you see Robotnik in the background before finally reaching the first proper boss. In Sonic 3, the first act boss will always be a large, unmanned robot, and the second is always Robotnik himself. You beat him and Knuckles flips a switch which sticks Sonic and Tails into the depths of Hydro City Zone. When playing as Sonic, a majority of Hydro City Zone's water portions are mandatory. There is no learning how to get past them, you just do it. Act 1 is filled with conveyor belts, moving platforms, and enemies that blast balls at you. The color palette is yellowish-brown, green, and blue. Act 2 starts off with the stage collapsing to the right as Sonic attempts to escape before getting crushed. The level is full of slides and moving cubes as opposed to straight water portions. The color palette transitions to purple and blue. Knuckles screws at you yet again and you face Dr. Robotnik leading you into Marble Garden Zone. Marble Garden Zone picks up the speed a little bit with downhill momentum but also contributes to the feeling of an adventure with Indiana Jones-esque booby traps and puzzles. Even the amount of spikes here is ramped up. Hmm. One cool thing about a series continuing for a while is it can start playing with the tropes of the series to surprise the player. The boss in Marble Garden Zone has Sonic and Tails flying through the air as Sonic jumps from Tails' grasps. The level darkens and transitions into Carnival Night Zone, which is one of the most frustrating levels in the whole series. Halfway through, ya boy Knuckles turns off the lights and floods the stage, adding more water portions to the game. There's also this barrel thing that anyone who has ever played this game has had trouble with. My opinion? Mm. Ice Cap Zone starts off with Sonic snowboarding down a hill and crashing into the bottom of the stage and getting covered with... Snow. As regular Sonic, this level is a nice cold breeze, but as Super Sonic, a lot of the platforming elements become difficult. There's a moment when you have to jump off of a never-ending slide at a particular moment, and as you do, there's a spring waiting to push you back onto the slide. As Super Sonic, you have less precision, so any light push in one direction will send you flying. The second act takes place outside more, but also has more water portions and a bottomless pit. The highlight of this level is undoubtedly the music. Launch Base Zone is the final level of Sonic 3, and the difficulty is just toned way down because there's a trick you can do to get infinite lives in the beginning of the stage. Anyways, you beat Robotnik and the game ends on a very low note. Sonic 3, when compared on its own, is nowhere near as being as good as Sonic 2. The game slows itself down for cinematic moments and the visual style is too cartoony for its own good. It excels in making the game feel like an adventure, but ultimately fails to capture a similar feeling to Sonic 2. However, it did improve on a lot. The game feels really connected, with all the levels leading into one another. Tails is now a different character than Sonic, and the special stages aren't only way better in Sonic 3 when compared to Sonic CD or Sonic 2, but they're also much more accessible, with multiple portals in each stage. You don't have to search the whole stage to find them, because you're likely to run into them by the time you reach Launch Base Zone. Sonic the Hedgehog 3, when compared on its own, is nowhere near as good as Sonic the Hedgehog 2. It slows down the game for an adventure type feeling and is way too cartoony for its own good. However, it does excel at making this big feeling of adventure, but ultimately loses the appeal that Sonic the Hedgehog 2 had. Sonic 3 was developed in congruence with Sonic and Knuckles, so in order to find out which classic Sonic game is the best, we must look at the complete combined version, Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Presents one champion of good, one pawn of evil. It's Sonic and Knuckles. Because Sonic 3 was split up into two parts to meet deadline and technical capabilities, Sonic and Knuckles was released as a second part of Sonic 3. Instead of just being a separate cartridge entirely, Sonic and Knuckles utilized what Sega branded as lock on technology. Think of it as Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows Part 1 and Part 2 being aired back to back on ABC Family as a part of Harry Potter Weekend. It feels like one whole movie, but alas, ABC Family, not every weekend can be a Harry Potter weekend. New features include being able to play as Knuckles with alternative story scenes and level designs in Sonic 3 and as an alternate character in Sonic 2. He can glide and break through stuff cause he's tough. 
By connecting Sonic 1, players can play an arcade-style version of the special stage. Seven new emeralds called the Super Emeralds. By collecting all 14 emeralds across Sonic 3 and Knuckles, players can turn into Hypersonic, alternative music and slight level design alteration for Sonic 3 portions of the game, and six new zones with one bonus stage. Mushroom Hill Zone introduces the first Sonic and Knuckles portion of the game. You see Knuckles sneaking out of a room and enter the Hidden Palace Zone. Here, the Chaos Emeralds turn into Super Emeralds and you lose your Super Sonic ability until you recollect them. Mushroom Hill Zone is definitely not a first level. Even though it's the first level in Sonic and Knuckles, it feels more at home inside of Sonic 3 and Knuckles as the seventh stage. All the enemies have some sort of challenge to them. The Dragonfly can only be killed by hitting its head, anywhere else will hurt you, the Mole will push you back, the Chicken will blow you back, and the screw has to be hit twice. The level transitions by the forest dying. It goes from green to brown to white, and then you see the boss. The main boss of the stage is really cool, because instead of being in the stationary arena, you have to run after Robotnik while dodging lines of spiky bombs. The parallax scrolling between the spikes and the pillars really makes for a nice 3D effect. This style of boss battle would be used heavily later on in the Sonic franchise. Flying Battery Zone you know, there are fire switches, enemy switches, cylindrical cheese graters, metal crushing electrical things, and jungle gym bars. Sandopolis Zone, at first, has a pretty generic desert level feel with quicksand, but Act 2. The level starts out dark and you have to hit a light switch to prevent these ghosts from getting bigger. They can't harm you while they're small, but as they get larger they can do damage, so it's a constant race through the level to get to the switch. It consistently makes me stressed whenever I play it. Lava Reef Zone plays a lot like other underground levels, with pulleys and moving platforms all to avoid lava. Throughout the stage, the lava will cool down and heat back up to give lots of hot and cool colors. After Lava Reef Zone comes Hidden Palace Zone. You fight Knuckles and Robotnik steals the Master Emerald. Knuckles takes Sonic up to Sky Sanctuary Zone. Sky Sanctuary Zone has Sonic running up towards the Death Egg, all while teleporting and bouncing on clouds. The highlight of this level is a fight with yet another Metal Sonic. Finally, we get to Death Egg Zone, and it's not the same Death Egg Zone from Sonic 2, but a brand new one that lets Sonic see the rest of the battle station, which is armed with transitioning gravity that is incredibly frustrating. The final boss in this level is incredibly awesome. It's Robotnik in a giant machine, and you have to destroy the little fingers. If you have all the emeralds, you can play as Hypersonic or Supersonic in the final battle against Robotnik, and it's surprisingly difficult. Since you're Super or Hypersonic, you can't take any damage, but you lose one ring every second, so it's a race to beat Robotnik and collect the rings. The game ends, you collect the Master Emerald, and everyone becomes friends the end. Sonic 3 and Knuckles set out to be a game that was bigger and better than Sonic 2 and many feel as if it achieved that. However, even though Sonic 3 and Knuckles added support for multiple characters and had a much larger story and overall greater feel than Sonic 2, the core gameplay and visual style of Sonic 2 is much better. Sonic 3 and Knuckles slows itself down for a sense of adventure, and although that's great, it's not a game you can just pick up and play like you can with Sonic 2. That's part of the reason why I think Sonic 3 and Knuckles is left out of a lot of compilations, or why there hasn't been a mobile port of it. Sonic 3 and Knuckles kind of loses the casual audience by sacrifice a tightly packed level-to-level -level experience for a wide adventure and story experience. As for the gameplay, in Sonic 2, you can skip water portions of a level if you know how to. In Sonic 3 and Knuckles, four of the first five stages have mandatory and significant water portions. Sonic 2 tried to up the speed from Sonic 1 and succeeded immensely, but Sonic 3 only ups the speed through set pieces. Sonic snowboarding, Sonic running through a cylinder or past a jet, it's not real and it's out of your control. There's a whole lot more classic platforming in Sonic 3, and even though it's solidly built, the game feels slow, and the bubbly visual style might even make it feel clunky at times. But building up a sense of speed was not what Sonic 3 was trying to do. Sonic 3 wanted to take a series of standalone levels and create a journey based off of them. In other Sonic games, different acts feel like an excuse to reuse visual assets. But Sonic 3, levels transition visually while you're playing. There's never a black screen between acts, and even though there's a black screen between levels, there's always a cutscene that helps bridge the gap on how Sonic can go from one level to the next. Sonic games that try to have a good story always overcomplicate things, and I think that's the writers overcompensating for the fact that they don't have confidence in the characters. The Sonic characters are fun and work in the right setting. 
The plot of Sonic 3 is incredibly simple. Robotnik comes to Angel Island to steal the Master Emerald, a large source of power. Knuckles lives on Angel Island for the sole purpose of protecting the Master Emerald. Robotnik tells Knuckles that Sonic is going to steal the Emerald, so Knuckles tries to prevent him from doing so. Later on, Robotnik steals it. Knuckles finds out Robotnik tricked him and everyone teams up to beat Robotnik. There's nothing too complex about it, yet if this game had dialogue, it would be one of the best Sonic plots out there because of its simplicity, yet its ability to have a source of drama. Knuckles finding out that he was tricked triggers the climax of the game's story. He's upset because he's wrong. This isn't dark drama, but it adds a sense of plot development and character development. Recent Sonic games have completely scrapped the importance of having a plot at all, and before that, Sonic games were overcomplicating their plot. There's never been a good mix of fun tone with dramatic story elements. Sonic 3 and Knuckles also had multiple character support. The game allows you to pick between four character variations. Each version of the game is slightly different. Tails, Knuckles, and Sonic can all access different parts of the stage that the other can't. Knuckles' gameplay is even suited to his story. Robotnik is almost never the boss because Knuckles doesn't know he's bad. Some bosses are altered to make it harder for Knuckles too. But you only have to play as Sonic to complete the full story, thus not forcing players to play slightly altered versions of the same game in order to get the complete version, like so many other Sonic games do. Sonic 3 sets itself to a high standard, and not only that, but it does everything it wants to do and exceeds expectation. But a lot of what Sonic 3 tries to do makes the game lose some of the qualities that made Sonic 2 so good. Sonic 3 & Knuckles is a game with a much larger scale than Sonic 2. However, the charm, speed, and graphical design of Sonic 2 makes it a much easier game to want to pick up and play. And because of that, I think Sonic 2 was the better game. But that being said, Sonic 3 & Knuckles is actually my favorite. All the classic Sonic games have their own unique qualities and feelings. This is when Sonic peaked, and that's not a bad thing. There's a reason why Sonic's still around, and it's not because of a long line of great and successful games, it's because these original five games created such a strong foundation for the series that it was able to last for 25 years. Sonic was Sega's poster boy for the Sega Genesis. However, after a long feud between the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo, Nintendo came out on top, outselling the Genesis by over 17 million units. In 1994, Sonic & Knuckles became the last Sonic game released for the Genesis, and actually, the last Sonic game to be released until 1999. Sega's next console, the Saturn, you are approaching Saturn. Was not as big as of a commercial success as the Sega Genesis. Part of the reason Sega fell so behind was because a new player was in the market. Sony. With the PlayStation. The PlayStation was a monster. Selling over 100 million units. In comparison, the Saturn only sold 9 million units. Even though there was a new Sonic game being developed for the Saturn, it never came to light, and Sega instead developed a half-assed racing game, an enhanced port for Sonic 3D Blast, and a compilation called Sonic Jam. The interesting thing about Sonic Jam is that it featured a 3D overworld for the menu, and this was actually a prototype for what was to come. Instead of focusing on the Saturn, Sega wanted to develop a new, more powerful console. But Sega was outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, and outplanned. They had to take an all-out stand. They were gonna need their right-hand man. <coughs> Infamously, on September 9th, 1999, Sega released the Dreamcast, and alongside it, Sonic Adventure. At its release, the Dreamcast was the strongest system technically on the market, and Sega really wanted to use Sonic Adventure not only to showcase the Dreamcast's capabilities, but also to reclaim Sonic's throne. At its release, Sonic Adventure received critical acclaim. However, over the years, the general consensus has been that it hasn't aged well. Before I continue, I just want to comment on something that really bothers me. A lot of the time, I get comments on my YouTube videos saying I've jumped on a bandwagon because I criticize Sonic. I have to disagree with this. I have stated many times that I'm a big fan of the Sonic the Hedgehog series. And on top of that, I don't think there is a bandwagon. Many people have been criticizing Sonic games the past few years not because it's suddenly become cool, but because games like Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2 have received re-releases, putting these games back into the public eye very briefly. And I hate to break it to you, but these YouTubers who are criticizing Sonic didn't have YouTube channels when these games originally came out, so they're now given the opportunity to voice their opinion. I love Sonic Adventure. I have a lot of great memories playing it. I'm nostalgic towards it. But it's really flawed, and it's my duty to treat it fairly. So with that being said, 
New features include redesigns for classic characters, two new characters, a new antagonist, six different interconnecting storylines, a full story with in-game cutscenes and voice acted dialogue, a new feature called the Chow Garden, and an interactive overworld which features passages to different levels and a majority of the cutscenes within the game. Instead of discussing Sonic Adventure level to level, I'm going to look at each character's story as a whole. Starting off with Sonic, we get the most comprehensive view of the story. This is the main event. Sonic arrives in Station Square to find an aquatic monster named Chaos attacking the police. Sonic defeats him, Eggman announces his plan to use Chaos to take over the world, and Sonic thinks nothing of it and hangs out by the pool, where he spots Tails' planes crashing. He rescues Tails, and the two meet up with Robotnik, now called by his proper name. Eggman. Eggman announces that he will use the Chaos Emeralds to power up Chaos, and Tails and Sonic go on a mission to find the Emeralds. While keeping them away from Eggman, they fail. They encounter Knuckles, who has been tricked by Eggman, again, and they go after the Egg Carrier, Eggman's flying fortress. Sonic and Tails try to fly up to the Egg Carrier, but get shot down, separating Tails and Sonic. Sonic meets up with Amy, she gets kidnapped, and he meets up with Tails again, who has rebuilt the tornado, this time being powered by a Chaos Emerald. On the Egg Carrier, Sonic and Tails must reach the other side of the ship to find Eggman. There, they face off against E-102 Gamma, one of Eggman's robots. Amy intervenes before Sonic can kill him. Tails and Amy flee the ship, and Eggman then powers Chaos up with six of the seven Emeralds. Sonic helps Big the Cat by defeating Chaos Six, who has Big's pet frog, Froggy, and then Sonic chases Eggman off the ship and tracks him down to the Mystic Ruins, where he comes across a mural of Chaos's full powered self. He has a vision of the past in which Chaos has seemingly destroyed the society of Knuckles' ancestors. Sonic then faces off against Eggman one more time, ending his story. Sonic's story is definitely the most straightforward. There's no character arc, just action and adventure. He meets up with other characters, but we're not given context yet as to why they're there. The story basically boils down to Sonic vs. Eggman, and there's nothing particularly wrong with that. As for his gameplay, it's a solid transition from 2D to 3D. Instead of majorly changing the structure of the game like Mario 64 did for the Mario series, Sonic Adventure tries to have a 1-1 translation from 2D to 3D. Sonic has all of his old moves and adds a few to make the game feel more like a Sonic game. The homing attack is used to give Sonic the feeling of bouncing off of enemies in a 2D space, and it works really well. There's platforming, running, and cinematic moments that all intertwine just as they did in the Genesis titles. The 3D space even helps with the problem of not seeing your enemy before they attack, but this one problem was replaced with another one, the camera. I know it's been beaten to death, but this camera is inexcusable at certain points, which sucks because Sonic does control really well. There are some points where it feels awkward, like when Sonic is running upside down or up against a wall, which just doesn't feel clean. But overall, he controls just as he did in the classic titles, just with a new plane of perspective which is being viewed by a 5 year old with an iPad camera. Even the level selection provides new locations while simultaneously calling back to older ones. But you're also given new level themes which provide variety, but even the older ones add flair. Because when you were playing Casino Night Zone, didn't you want to see Sonic taking a shower? I mean, no, that's disgusting, I mean, just think about how wet his socks are now. Gross. The game also recreates moments from the classic games, snowboarding down a hill, boarding Eggman's base from the tornado, etc. Sonic's story captures the essence of the series while providing an overview of the story, but in order to fill in the details, you have to play the rest. Next, we get to Tails. His story picks up right where Sonic finds him. Tails is testing out a new prototype for his plane to be powered by Chaos Emerald. His story follows Sonic's up to the point until after they get separated. Then, he's determined to fend for himself and he finishes his prototype. He picks up Sonic, follows him, and brings Amy back to Station Square. There, Eggman, after being defeated by Sonic, vows to blow up Station Square. His missile is a dud, and he races Tails to the missile. Tails beats him to it, and then decides that he will take on Eggman without the help of Sonic. He succeeds, proving that he is independent of his friend. Tails' story gives him a nice arc. He gets rescued by Sonic in the beginning, only to prove that he can fend for himself. Even Tails' gameplay contributes to his story. All of his levels, except for the final one against Eggman, require him to beat Sonic in a race. All of Tails' levels are present in Sonic's story, but are easier and shorter in order to make the player not feel like they're repeating the same level over and over again. Even though his gameplay is slightly different due to the fact that he can fly, the camera is the same. But having shorter levels prevents the camera from screwing up as much as it does in Sonic's story. Knuckles' story starts at the earliest point. He's guarding the Master Emerald on Angel Island, as he does, contemplating how he has to guard it forever. Chaos appears, seemingly being the cause of a now-broken Master Emerald. Knuckles tries to beat him up, but he escapes. 
Knuckles goes looking for other pieces of the emeralds, gets a flashback of his ancestors, and sees Eggman walking with what appears to be a piece of the Master Emerald. Knuckles confronts Eggman, who shows him chaos, and despite Knuckles knowing that this is the creature he saw when the Master Emerald broke, he allows Eggman to trick him by telling him Sonic is the one who broke the emerald. Knuckles confronts Sonic to find out he was tricked again. Knuckles fights chaos and finds more pieces of the Master Emerald. He has one more flashback and sneaks onto the egg carrier to find the final pieces. After Sonic fights Chaos 6, Knuckles finishes the job and goes back to Angel Island with the final pieces and the rest of the Chaos Emeralds. Despite having flashbacks to his ancestors' past, Knuckles admits that he may never know why he has to guard the Master Emerald, despite basically having an opportunity to find out. Knuckles' gameplay is all about finding the missing pieces of the Emerald. It's basically a treasure hunt. Some levels require a little bit of problem solving to find the Emeralds, but generally, the radar of the bottom of the screen is all you need. Some of the requirements to find the emeralds are extremely easy, but some aren't immediately obvious. For example, one emerald in Casinoopolis is located inside a grate. The radar keeps beeping right below the grate, but the entrance is in a completely different spot, and the radar won't be going off while in front of this spot, so I ended up wasting my time looking for the emerald in the wrong place. The level length can vary from less than 2 minutes to over 15 because of this. Just like Tails' story, Knuckles' story is short and to the point. I just have one question about the contents of the story itself. Wouldn't it make more sense for Knuckles to be the main character? The whole story is centered around his dead culture, but he never has a realization about it or does anything about it. In fact, at the end of the story, he's still wondering why he has the job he has, which this should have been an answer within his story. This game had a perfect opportunity to do so, but decided to skip over it for whatever reason. Next, we get to Amy's story, and when we first see her, she's thinking about Sonic after going shopping. Cause that's what girls do, right? They think about boys while shopping? She runs into a bird that's being hunted by one of Eggman's robots, Zero, and she vows to protect it. But first, she asks Sonic to protect it because she couldn't possibly do it on her own. Instead of defeating Zero, her gameplay is centered around running away from him. Because why wouldn't Amy be the only character not capable of defeating a robot? Zero kidnaps Amy and the bird and brings them aboard the egg carrier. E1 and 2 Gamma confronts Amy and demands she give him the bird. Amy refuses, showing Gamma the emotion of love. She later intervenes with Sonic and Gamma's fight and prevents Sonic from killing Gamma. Amy and Tails leave the egg carrier and Amy sees that the bird is missing its family. She goes to Eggman's base to look for the family, but decides it's probably on the egg carrier instead. There, the bird finds its family, and Amy beats the shit out of Zero. Finally. Amy has the shortest story, and I think I've made it obvious that I have a few problems with it. First, they aged up Amy from when we last saw her. So her obsession with Sonic is no longer a little girl with a crush, but it's someone who is close to Sonic's age. So her crush goes from being cute to kind of harassment. And since she's older now, her being kidnapped is because she's a girl, not because she's a kid. Her story is actually similar to Tails. It's about her becoming independent, but at the same time she needs a weapon and is unable to defeat Zero on her own without using her surroundings. She's clearly painted as weaker than the other characters. Plus, the focus of her story is on the bird, not her becoming independent. Where Tails has the full focus of being independent, even though we've seen him act on his own in Sonic 3. Next we get to... Big the Cat's story, and I really don't know what to say about this, so I won't. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Haydox. Big story really encapsulates the feeling of being lost in the wilderness and finding true love. We first see Big in a cottage, and with his friend Froggy, he's just hanging out in a manger. But what happens to Big next is that Froggy finds a Chaos Emerald and eats it, causing him to grow a tail and grow out of control. Big, being the lover that he is, chases after Froggy who tries to escape this fat cat. Big goes on this big adventure to try to find Froggy, and it eventually turns out successful for him when he fights Chaos 6 on the Egg Carrier. In a short battle, he gets Froggy back and returns him to his home without the Chaos Emerald. And after that, we don't really know what happens to Big. Could Big be living out the days with his frog lover? Could he be raising children of his own with his frog lover? After all, this is a story about frog and cat love. That's the main driving force in Big's narrative, love. Maybe unnatural love, but Big and Froggy's love is real, and we see it through the story and gameplay. Thanks. 
Big's gameplay gets frustrating really quick. It involves fishing for Froggy and the camera becomes a real hindrance. His controls are really frustrating and his gameplay is out of place with the rest. But once you figure out how to catch Froggy the very first time, the tactic doesn't really change and the rest of the levels become a breeze. Gamma's story is the final part and what a lot of people call the heart and soul of the game. Gamma is a robot created in a series by Eggman. Eggman demands Gamma and his older brother Beta to battle to the death because apparently self-sufficient robot upkeep is too expensive now. I guess Dr. Eggman has so much time on his hands that all the effort he put into these robots is meaningless. Gamma then outperforms the rest of his brothers on a task that Eggman demanded. All of his brothers are sent off and punished. Amy shows Gamma that you can care for other beings and his life is changed. He decides that he must free his siblings by destroying them. Which at first seems very generic and overused, especially involving robots. Until you remember that Eggman's machines are powered by little baby animals. Gamma and Beta destroy each other and it is revealed that they are powered by the two birds that Amy's bird was looking for, and so everyone gets reunited. Yay! Huh, that's actually really clever. And don't get me wrong, the sentient robot misinterpreting something resulting in murder has been done a million times. But here, in E102 Gamma's story, it seems to be going in a generic route until you realize that the idea of freedom is literal in this established canon. The robots in Sonic have always been powered by baby animals. His gameplay, oddly enough, is the fastest paced of all, even more so than Sonic. There's emphasis on speed, but he's a robot that can shoot. And the way his shooting is incorporated into the gameplay is pretty simple. He has a time limit on the level, but he gets extra time for shooting enemies, which is a pretty clever way of combining the two types of play. Throughout all six stories, characters have visions of the past, and in the final Super Sonic story, all these visions come together when Chaos steals the Chaos Emeralds from Knuckles, and Tails planes to become perfect chaos. Gross. Sonic finds out that Tykel sealed herself in the Master Emerald to prevent Chaos from eventually destroying the world. Eventually. Sonic says that he won't seal Chaos back in the Master Emerald, but instead will open his heart. Sonic defeats Chaos in the most epic and easy boss battle of all time. And then Chaos, along with Takal and the Chows, ascend into the clouds. Heaven. Whatever. The end. Oh yeah, I skipped the part where the Chows were murdered. The end. Sonic Adventure was a very ambitious game and was very impressive for the time it was released. It wanted to showcase the power of the Dreamcast while also translating Sonic's gameplay into 3D. And let's see, 5 divided by 6 times 100. 83.3% of the stories do that. The game is still just good for its time and has not aged well. The animation is atrocious, the camera is atrocious, the voice acting is atrocious, and apparently the voice actors were never given context to the scenes they were recording for, resulting in strange line readings. Oh no. Give it your best. Oh no. And just to clarify, I don't think these voice actors are bad, I think they were just given really, really bad direction. I find it interesting that even though this game is called Sonic Adventure, it never feels like an adventure. All the levels are more tasks than contributions to the story. The characters always go to a level, then come back to the overworld for the story to progress. It's not linear enough to feel like a real adventure. It should be called Sonic Errand Runner. Be right back, gotta get a Chaos Emerald. Oops, Tails crashed, let me go pick him up. All the stories do interconnect, but they aren't all a part of the same story. It's more like a series of vignettes rather than an all-encompassing narrative. I do feel like the story succeeds as a story. It's not too engrossing, but it's satisfying. The story not only isn't overdramatic, but it expands on established lore, something no other Sonic game really has tried to do. The Chaos Emeralds are a big plot point, and we get a possible explanation for why Dr. Eggman wanted the Master Emerald in the last game. And even though we've seen most of these characters before, this is when they were clearly defined. The way they talk, the way they interact with each other, and how they feel about each other. On top of that, characters like Amy and Tails are given a character arc. 
The story is almost everything I'd want out of Sonic the Hedgehog story. Of course, I'm not moved by it, but I had fun watching it and playing through it, and that's all it needs to be. When I was younger, Sonic Adventure was one of my favorite games ever. And looking back on it, I am very nostalgic towards it. However, I accept its flaws. I definitely still enjoyed playing it, but I recognize that many people who didn't grow up with it may not enjoy it as much as I did. I love Sonic, and I love Sonic Adventure, but I'm not too proud enough to say that it's a great game just because I enjoy it. It helped relaunch Sonic into the public eye after years of no main series game, and it's definitely important to the character's history and to the fans. The Sega Dreamcast had a fast lifespan. Its legacy is written with a nicely sized collection of great games and a strong, dedicated cult following. In early 2001, not even a year and a half after launch, Sega announced that it would be discontinuing the Dreamcast within the year, making its lifespan just over two years. When Sonic Adventure 2 was being produced, Sega knew it was going to be the last Sonic game to come out for a Sega system, and the timing couldn't be better. For Sonic's 10th anniversary, they wanted to go all out. Like the relation to Sonic 1 and 2, Adventure 1 was developed by Sega of Japan, and Adventure 2 would be developed by Sega of America. Even at this point, the goal for Sonic Adventure 2 would be to bring Sonic back to his roots and focus more on action as the classic games did. Gone would be the overworld, and the focus would turn from the story to the gameplay. Sega wanted Adventure 2 to mimic an American vibe, with references to American film and locations. City Escape is based off of San Francisco, where Sega of America's office was located at the time of the game's development. When the game was announced at E3, only Sonic, Knuckles, Eggman, and a teaser of Shadow was shown. There would be no Rouge or Tails gameplay. They were added later on after Fan Outcry. Sonic Adventure 2 was released worldwide on June 19th, 2001. New features include two-player versus gameplay, an expanded Chow Garden with Dreamcast VNU and Game Boy Advance compatibility, being able to play as Dr. Eggman, two new characters, new abilities, and two truly interconnecting storylines. The theme of the game would be light versus dark. Instead of each character having their own story, you'd play through the hero story and the dark story separately, illustrating each side of the narrative from different points of view. The hero story starts off with Sonic escaping from a military helicopter. After probably murdering all of the personnel, Sonic rolls around at the speed of sound, escaping a truck and then he beats up a robot. Afterwards, he meets Shadow who jogs right by Sonic. Sonic figures out that Shadow uses the Chaos Emerald to run fast, and then Shadow uses a move called Chaos Control to teleport out of there. Sonic gets recaptured by the military. Fast forward to Knuckles, who is not on Angel Island guarding the Master Emerald. Instead, he's discussing who truly owns the Master Emerald with a drawing from the character designer's private sketchbook that was mistaken for game production notes. Eggman sees that Knuckles is distracted and takes the opportunity to try to steal the Master Emerald. And instead of trying to get it back, Knuckles punches it so hard that it shatters. And of course, it doesn't just shatter around the tiny little area they're in, but all around the Earth. Knuckles goes looking for the missing pieces. Next, we see Tails flying towards Prison Island to rescue Sonic. He sees Eggman approaching Amy, who is there for the same reason. Tails beats up Eggman, and they go into the prison to rescue Sonic. Amy lets Sonic out, who runs away from the military base, hops on a missile that leads him to a platform in the middle of the ocean, where I guess he kind of teleports to the middle of the rainforest, because it was in the middle of the ocean, and last time I checked, Sonic can't swim. He sees Shadow, and for whatever reason, they call each other a fake hedgehog. And because their hedgehog masculinity is so fragile, they fight. Over Shadow's radio, Eggman tells Shadow to leave the island before it blows up. Tails, Amy, and Sonic all escape before the island does. Go back to Knuckles, where he finds a few more pieces of the emerald. Eggman announces over TV that he has a super weapon, and open fires on the moon. Half of the moon is destroyed, and the biggest inconsistency in Sonic ever is created. Okay. So, Sega says the reason why we never see the moon blown up in other Sonic games after this is because we're viewing another side of the moon when in fact the moon rotates at the same rate that it revolves around the Earth. Because of that, we only ever see one side of the moon from Earth. It's called tidal locking. Thanks, AST-1002. Tails runs around the city, Knuckles finds more emeralds in some mine, and then he meets up with the rest of the crew. Tails drives up close to the president's car, and then Eggman demands that President... Bushton 
surrender to the Eggman Empire or his country will cease to exist. And because the president was making this top secret call with the goddamn window open, Sonic hears it and says, NO WAY! and jumps into the car. Sonic and Tails find out that Eggman was transmitting his signal from the space colony, Ark. And yes, I too was able to determine that because the signal was coming from space, Eggman's secret base on Earth must be in Egypt. There, Knuckles finds three keys to unlock Eggman's base, and he fights a ghost. Huh? Why? They break into Eggman's base and steal a shuttle. On the spaceship, Knuckles gets frustrated and accidentally releases the pieces of the Master Emerald he had into space. The crew then develops a plan to use the fake emerald that Tails created to throw off Eggman, who needs all seven Chaos Emeralds to power the Eclipse Cannon, the super weapon on the Ark. Knuckles goes off and finds more emeralds on a meteor and fights. How the heck did you guys find my Deviant Art? She slips and almost falls into some lava, and even though she clearly has wings, Knuckles has to save her. Then Rouge gives Knuckles this look. Yo. Eggman kidnaps Amy and demands that Tails and Sonic give over the emerald they have. Sonic tries to give Eggman the fake emerald, and Eggman's like, Do you think you could fool me with that fake emerald? And Tails is like, How did you know it was a fake? And Eggman responds, Cause you just told me! Sonic sneers at Tails like, Tails, you stupid piece of shit. But he keeps his cool and says, Take care of Amy. Sonic gets launched out into space, and Tails beats up Eggman. Sonic attempts to use Chaos Control and is able to use it with the fake emerald. Sonic runs around and finds Shadow, who's like, I have to kill you. Sonic beats up Shadow and places the fake emerald in the arc, saving the day. Hey look, he's looking at you. He's looking at you. Heading over to the dark story, we see Eggman breaking into a gun facility. There, he finds Shadow, his grandfather's secret project. Shadow introduces himself as the ultimate life form, whatever that means. And for releasing him, Shadow promises Eggman a wish as long as Eggman brings him Chaos Emeralds to eat. And also, Eggman has to meet him on the Space Colony arc. Then we see Knuckles and Rouge. They both go off to find Master Emerald pieces. Eggman goes home after a long day of work and flips on TV to see that Shadow stole a Chaos Emerald. Reporters and the government have now mistaken Shadow for Sonic. Shadow has a flashback to his friend Maria, who was killed by gun soldiers aboard the Space Colony Ark 50 years ago. He promises her revenge. Shadow confronts Sonic where he jogs by him slowly. Ruse breaks into Eggman's base while Eggman and Shadow go into space. Shadow explains to Eggman that the Ark has a super weapon called the Eclipse Cannon, but they need the Chaos Emeralds to use it. Ruse gets caught in Eggman's base and tempts Eggman and Shadow by telling them where there are three Chaos Emeralds. They all go to Prison Island, Rouge steals the emeralds, Eggman gets beat up by Tails, and Shadow lays down explosives to blow up the island. Shadow sees Sonic, they call each other fake hedgehogs, and then they fight. Eggman yells at Shadow to get off the island before it blows up! But first he rescues Rouge, because he's a nice guy like that. The island blows up, and you, as a six-year-old kid playing this for the first time, realized you just killed thousands upon thousands of people. Eggman fires the Eclipse Cannon at the moon, and then Rouge and Shadow try to track down the last Chaos Emerald, which Tails has. They fail. All of the heroes infiltrate Eggman's base, and Eggman has to fight this guy. They head into space, Rouge fights Knuckles, and the sexual tension gets too intense to watch any longer. Eggman kidnaps Amy, sends Sonic into space, and then Shadow questions Rouge on being a government agent. He's like, Rouge, are you a government agent? And then Rouge is like, yeah, but are you even the real Shadow? Shadow's like, alright, but I have to go beat up Sonic. Then Shadow's like, yo, Sonic, respect for using chaos control, they fight, someone wins? In the final story, after entering all seven Chaos Emeralds into the Eclipse Cannon, a secret message is played from Dr. Eggman's grandfather. He says that once all seven Chaos Emeralds are entered into the cannon, the Ark will crash into Earth, wiping out humanity, and that this is revenge for Maria being killed 50 years ago. All the heroes and villains are like, oh no, we can't let that happen, so everyone but Shadow and Amy work together to stop the Ark from following. Shadow's like, I'm okay with everyone dying, until he realizes Maria didn't want people to die. Shadow's like, Oh, she didn't want me to kill everyone. Okay. He gets down to the bottom of the ship where there is a replica of the Master Emerald Shine from Sonic Adventure 1. There, a giant fucking lizard comes out of nowhere. And Shadow's like, he's not the ultimate life form. I am. Shadow beats up the giant fucking lizard. Then, Knuckles uses the Master Emerald to stop the Chaos Emeralds. But then, the giant fucking lizard uses Chaos Control to teleport itself outside the ship. And Shadow's like, is that what Chaos Control is? I guess the line just sounded cool because he clearly did know what it was. Then Sonic and Shadow are like, we have to stop him. Because we've lived. And learned. 
They go super and beat up the Bio Lizard by popping his gross ass pimples. No, seriously. Shadow's then like, I must go. My home planet needs me. And the game is like, They all get along temporarily. The end. And at this point, this final image in the game became every 12 year old's desktop wallpaper. Okay, where do I begin? The story is certainly fun, but by no means is it good. If Gun raided the Ark and killed Maria and had Shadow under custody, why did they mistake Sonic for Shadow? If Amy proved herself in Sonic Adventure, why did she get kidnapped again and why didn't she help at the end of the game? If Rouge was working for Gun, why did she let Eggman blow up Prison Island and kill possibly thousands of soldiers? If Maria was so important to Shadow, how come he didn't remember her last words or why did Shadow think Maria would want him to murder everyone? Why is a lizard Shadow's prototype? What does the ultimate life form mean? But most importantly, why did I enjoy this story? I think it's because it was different. Sonic Adventure really feels like a big grand adventure. It's fun and lighthearted. But Sonic Adventure 2 is dark, and even at the end it's not upbeat. It feels like the second entry of a trilogy, but it's not a part of a trilogy. I think that's why so many people want to see a Sonic Adventure 3. I also think a reason why I enjoy the story is because of the character interaction. The pairings are fun, and you see the characters act in ways that they had it in previous games. You see Sonic get frustrated. He attacks Shadow without being provoked. Tails and Eggman work together. Knuckles, a character who has been living alone on a deserted floating island his whole life, meets a promiscuous and flirtatious treasure hunter. The whole story seems like an adventure, too. It's linear. And like so many adventure stories, there's a map laid out for you so you can follow the character's progression. It keeps its momentum, which is something Adventure 1 failed to do. And what helps maintain a fast-paced and energetic feeling is the soundtrack, which many people will agree with me when I say it's one of the best Sonic soundtracks. So here to talk about Sonic Adventure 2's music, Steven Nux. The music of SA2. Well, it's something special. Alright, look, my name is Steven Nux, and Multidimensional was most definitely snubbed at the Grammy Awards. What sets this soundtrack apart from what you're used to in 2001 is that there's a great amount of character personality. In SA1, you have the epic film score-like sound signifying grand moments and adventure. The soundtrack was varied with instruments, feelings, and scope to give Sonic a grand jump into 3D. The benefit of SA2 is that since it doesn't have to rely on being the gigantic first impression, it can explore other areas of music most notably vocal themes in regular stages. We've never seen that before with Sonic, and we never will. Knuckles has raps to continue his chill, tough persona from SA1. Rouge introduced with relaxed jazz composition to illustrate her smooth, sexy personality. Shadow and Sonic with intense guitar melodies because high speed action and Tails and Eggman with more of an industrial electric guitar sound. A lot of the tracks are pretty recognizable, especially the lead track, Live and Learn. I'm sure you've heard this song. SA2 soundtrack is nostalgic as hell, does every character justice, and rightfully deserves its place in the Sonic Hall of Fame, if that exists. Thanks, Steven. So even though there are six different characters in-game, the gameplay is only broken down into three unique types. First, Sonic and Shadow. We get a great selection of levels, all of which provide the essentials for Sonic. Fast action gameplay and cinematic moments. I have to say, City Escape may be one of the best openings to any Sonic game ever. The music, the level design, the opening cutscenes, and the truck set the mood for how Sonic will play. Where the gameplay doesn't shine is within the boss battles. The camera is locked down and nearly out of your control, creating a locked-in environment that's hard to maneuver. The wall running mechanic in this game feels better than it did in Sonic Adventure, and the inclusion of rail grinding in the more quickly accessed light dash allows Sonic to keep moving forward without having to stop. Sonic and Shadow are given a somersault ability which is used to go under things and easily destroy boxes. However, it's the same button as the spin dash, so using the spin dash while running becomes nearly obsolete. Levels like City Escape, Radical Highway, and Green Forest have become some of the best levels in the franchise history, and it illustrates the potential the series has. I enjoy every moment when I play as Sonic and Shadow, truthfully every moment. So moving on to Rouge and Knuckles, we see the game slow down. 
significantly. Just like in Sonic Adventure, Knuckles' gameplay is centered around hunting for the missing pieces of the Master Emerald. But in Adventure 2, the radar only shows one emerald at a time, so even if you're right next to the wrong emerald shard, the radar won't go off. The small levels and the levels that are easily traversed are fun, but the larger levels can take up to 20 minutes to complete, and the emeralds are in random locations every time, so even if you've played through the game, you have to search for them. Speedrunning's almost impossible. The camera in-game is terrible, and when you're going through small corridors looking for emeralds, it becomes evident how truly atrocious it is. Levels like Aquatic Mine have tons of underwater corridors that you can drown in, and when the camera makes it hard to even play through, it's more unfair than truly challenging. Mad Space has transitioning gravity between different planetary bodies. The gravity mechanic is incredibly frustrating because the control scheme changes when gravity changes. I can confidently say that these two levels are some of the worst in the franchise's history. And it's weird to note because as a kid, my least favorite level was Security Hall, because there was a 5 minute time limit. But now, it's one of my favorites because it does a good job with keeping the gameplay fast. Finally, we get to Eggman and Tails, who attempt to recreate Gamma's gameplay style from Sonic Adventure but they miss the ball pretty hard because the gameplay is significantly slower. And even though their mechs don't platform well, a lot of their gameplay requires platforming. In order to rack up points, you have to lock onto multiple enemies before shooting them. I have to admit that unloading on these enemies actually kind of feels good. You stupid piece of shit. The only truly fun level I would say is Cosmic Wall in which Eggman's jet boosters can be used without limit due to the low gravity. But besides that, these levels aren't too overly frustrating, but they're not fun either, they're just kind of there. Players are also given the option to go through levels to perform alternate missions. This includes collecting 100 rings, finishing the level in a certain amount of time, a hard mode, etc. Another new feature in the game is the ranking system. Maybe I didn't try hard enough. By finishing the level in a good time and by performing some sweet moves, you earn points. And sometimes these point notifications can be sarcastic assholes. Yeah. The more points you get, the more likely you are to get a good ranking. By getting A rankings for all the characters, you unlock alternate costumes for the two-player mode. And some of them are... Well... The two-player versus mode basically boils down to racing, hunting treasure, and shooting the heck out of each other. There's also a bare minimum kart racing mode based on the kart segments from the game. The two-player mode is a good way to kill 20 minutes, but the real replayability comes from the Chow Garden. The Chows originated in Sonic Adventure, and although you can raise them in that game, Sonic Adventure 2 has much more diverse options. Players play through levels to collect rings which can buy them items. Enemies in-game either drop a colored battery or a baby animal. By giving Chows one of these, they'll have their abilities raised and take on physical attributes of the animals. If you raise them nicely with hero characters or dark characters, they can turn into either a hero or a dark Chow, and you can actually have them change physical features depending on which attributes are stronger. You can unlock different gardens that correlate to hero and dark, and you can also take them with you via the Game Boy Advance Link Cable. I've killed too many hours of my young life playing this game for the Chow Garden. Sega, whatever you do, please do not bring back the Chow Garden. I will never get anything done. But hey, if you want to, please bring it back. I have trouble articulating my overall thoughts for this game, because the Sonic and Shadow levels are great and they earn being fun. It's not a situation where you have to look past huge flaws. But then the shooting levels can be boring and the treasure hunting levels are abysmal and really slow down the game, and not in a way that complements the pacing. It's truthfully a game that I can't give an overall consensus to, because the good parts are too good for it to be considered bad, but the bad parts are too bad for it to be considered good. It kind of just exists. Sonic Adventure 2 was the last Sonic game released for a Sega console. It marked the end of an era, but it also marked the beginning of a new one. In December of 2001, Sonic Adventure 2 was re-released as Sonic Adventure 2 Battle for the Nintendo GameCube. Sega had shaken hands with Nintendo and allowed me to experience the game. I have a lot of fond memories playing Sonic Adventure 2. In fact, it's one of my favorite games. In December of 2002 for Christmas, I got a Nintendo GameCube along with Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. And before I had a GameCube, I had a Nintendo 64. So the concept of a memory card was kind of foreign to me. Every time I boot up the game, I hear Sonic say, Did you insert a memory card? I played that game to no end and I committed it to memory. The first time I ever beat Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, I did it without ever saving. This game means a lot to a lot of people, and it was an entrance point for a lot of people into the series. 
and although I do not think as a whole it should be considered a good game, I understand the importance it has within the series, and I think it really has impacted it positively. And even though as an individual standalone title, I don't think it's considered good, I think it ultimately did good for the Sonic series. And at the end of the day, I think that's more important than being an individually good title. You're a hedgehog, and you have supersonic powers. Ball up right now and roll! Action! Come on, honey, and you're brave. After the Sonic Adventure series was re-released on the GameCube, Sega had established itself as a successful third-party company. Sonic Adventure 2 Battle went on to become the ninth best-selling game on the GameCube, and Sega was ready to reach a new audience. In order to broaden their horizon, the adventure title would be dropped. The game was to be published on all three major consoles and PC, and once again, the focus would turn from the story to action and adventure. I'm loving it. Sonic Heroes was to be a soft reboot for the series. The art design would go back to a classic look, and instead of only focusing on a core group of characters, every goddamn character ever was added because that's how you create a game that invites new fans. New features include team-based gameplay with four different teams surrounding three different archetypes. Speed, which is fast, power, which is strong, and flight, which is high. One new character in, that's really it. The game isn't aiming to do anything new. It just wanted to be a 3D Sonic game. But my question is, has it been forgotten because it didn't do anything unique? Or is it a hidden gem? There were development issues with the Xbox and PlayStation 2 version, as Sega had never developed for those consoles. The GameCube version is considered the best, with the alternate ports having severe frame rate issues. Even though I do own the GameCube version, I'll be looking at the Xbox version, mostly because it's easier to capture footage from it. So let's take a look at that story. First, we get to Team Sonic, which is compromised of Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles. The story begins and Sonic is running around the desert. Tails and Knuckles pull up next to him and Sonic says the single most common phrase in any Sonic game ever. Long time no see! Tails gives Sonic a letter from Eggman, which states that Eggman will take over the world in three days. Team Sonic goes to stop him. Every time they think they see Eggman, it turns out to be a decoy, and the audience gets to see that it's a metal Sonic-looking character disguising itself as Eggman. Oh, I love that dramatic irony. They infiltrate Eggman's armada and save the day. That's it. The Sonic story is simple and fun and relies on nothing but the gameplay. But we do need to find out why that definitely not Metal Sonic character sent Sonic and the crew on this wild goose chase. Next, we get to Team Dark, which is made up of Shadow, Rouge, and E123 Omega, a new character which is one of Eggman's robots who wants to kill everything. The story starts off with Rouge entering Eggman's secret base, and she finds Shadow locked in a container. She lets him out, but then Omega attacks him. Rouge breaks up the fight and states they all need to go looking for Eggman together, because also Shadow has amnesia. BT dubs, all the characters follow the same path, so the moment where it's revealed in Sonic's story that the Eggman is a decoy, we also see that there's a Shadow decoy. Shadow's like, is this real life? They leave, and a Metal Sonic looking type says he has scanned the ultimate life form data. They infiltrate Eggman's armada and Rouge discovers a room full of fake shadows. And then apparently Shadow's amnesia gets so bad that he forgets he has amnesia. I might as well go look for that Master Emerald since that irritating Echidna is here. <laughs> Something's never changed. When picking a character heavy story arc, either pick number one, the character has amnesia, or number two, the character may be a replica of himself. The reason they don't work at the same time is because the dramatic elements of possibly being a clone contradict the amnesia part. Because a character wouldn't care if he was a clone with fabricated memories if they didn't have the memories in the first place. If I'm not real, I'm still the ultimate life form. Shadow the head. Why would Shadow say that if he doesn't even know what it means? I have a suggestion that would make both the amnesia part and the maybe Shadow's not real part make sense. You know that Metal Sonic looking character that we keep seeing? Yeah, that's actually Metal Sonic in disguise. Spoiler alert. At the end of the game, what if Rouge only finds one Shadow capsule? And as she's opening it, the other shadow comes out from behind her and starts to melt like the Eggman decoy did. Then, we find out that the shadow you've been playing with the whole game 
was actually a Metal Sonic disguised as Shadow. It would add to established elements of the game's story and make both the amnesia and possible replica story make sense. Team Rose. Cream the Rabbit loses her chow, Big loses Froggy again, and Amy wants to bang Sonic. They go on a quest to find their friends and something cracks and Amy finally realizes that she needs to threat Sonic to get with Sonic. Amy, what are you doing here? Sonic, this time there's no way out of marrying me. Sonic, give up. This time you're mine. All but Amy successfully reached their goal. There's not much else to say. Team Chaotic's story begins with Vector the Crocodile, Charmy the Bee, and Espio the Chameleon getting a package from a mysterious client. They all need money to pay the rent, so they take a non-descriptive job that eventually turns out to be rescuing someone from Eggman's base. Vector makes observations about the pseudo-Eggman... Eggmen... And then he comes to the conclusion that they are, in fact, rescuing Eggman from Eggman's base. When they ask to get paid, Eggman can't pay them. I have to admit, I enjoyed the Chaotix more than I should have. I know a lot of people think they're annoying, but here, we don't get a massive amount of time spent on their dialogue, so to me, it's the perfect amount. After you beat all the stories, you find out that Eggman was captured by Metal Sonic. Metal Sonic transforms into a big Metal Sonic, and all the 12 characters have to beat him up. After that, Metal is looking all pathetic, and Sonic says, Hey, you can challenge me anytime! Omega picks him up, and Sonic advertises the game you just beat. Yeah! We're Sonic Heroes! The plot of Sonic Heroes isn't as in-depth as the Sonic Adventure titles, so there's not a whole lot to criticize. What I do have to say about it, however, is that the presentation is better than both Sonic Adventure and Adventure 2. This is the only time we get to hear these voice actors both recording their dialogue under good circumstances and with proper sound mixing. Moving forward into the gameplay. Despite having 12 characters, there really only are three different playstyles. Speed, Power, and Flight. First, your speed characters, Sonic, Shadow, Amy, and Espio. They're fast and have specific abilities that complement that. The homing attack returns, there's an ability to stir up wind and a spin dash type attack that's hardly ever used. Sonic and Shadow have a wall jumping ability and the light dash. Espio can turn invisible and Amy has a projectile wind attack. You think in a Sonic game the speed characters would be the focus, but in reality they have the least amount of polished controls. They're too fast, and I know that sounds absurd, but stopping and changing directions seems impossible at times. However, because Amy's the girl, she's slower than all the other characters, and actually it makes her the most fun to play. Moving on to the flying characters, Tails, Rouge, Cream, and Charmy, all of them can fly for a short distance. They all have a Thunder Shoot ability, which allows them to propel the other two characters forward as a weapon, but Cream has a third projectile, her Chow Cheese. Charmy can open up a robotic flower, and Tails and Rouge have a Dummy Ring ability. Playing as the flight characters is extremely slow, and unless they're completely powered up, their characters can only stun enemies. Finally, we get to the power characters. Knuckles, Omega, Big, and Vector. Knuckles and Omega primarily use the other characters as projectile weapons, but Big and Vector rely on themselves mostly, by slamming their own weight down on the enemy. The reason that makes these three different archetypes integral to the gameplay is because enemies now have other requirements to beat them other than just jumping on their head. They have health bars now. Power characters can more easily drain enemies' health, flying characters can stun enemies, and speed characters can make enemies easier to hit. But it really slows down the pacing. But when you're able to get into a rhythm with the different characters and take down enemies, it feels rewarding. But it happens too often and slows down levels which are already... absurdly long. Part of the way difficulty changes is through the level length. Team Rose ranges anywhere from 2 to 4 minutes. Okay. Team Sonic ranges anywhere from 8 to 12 minutes. <sighs> and Team Dark ranges anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. The level length doesn't even contribute to the core difficulty either. Instead, it creates a challenge of will, which is easily seen in the last level of Team Dark's storyline, Final Fortress. You see, before an incredibly hard final section, there's a checkpoint. That's good! But the last checkpoint before that is about 6 minutes behind it. If you keep dying and you play for close to 6 minutes each time you die, that time adds up very fast. I was originally going to criticize how hard certain aspects were, like this one ridiculously hard part at the end, but having an intense difficulty is okay. What's not okay is the hour of work to get back to it every time I get a game over. Even though there are unique aspects to the level, depending on who you're playing as, a majority is recycled and gets incredibly stale. 
It took me more time to beat this game than it did for me to play through both Sonic Adventure and Adventure 2, but those games have more unique content. Finally, moving on to Team Chaotix. I actually enjoyed their gameplay more than I thought I would. All of their levels are mission-based, and some can be incredibly easy, while others can be equally as frustrating as Team Dark. You can tell this game was built for linear platforming, and a lot of their missions require you to find things, but the levels aren't built for a collectathon. A lot of times, you can just play through the level and complete the mission at hand, but sometimes you need to run through the same level multiple times to find multiple objects. So I want to clarify, I think this game had amazing potential. But the problem is, it came out over 10 years ago, and the potential has burned into a legacy. And it's a legacy I cannot stand. It's not because the game is bad, either. I can tell effort was buried into it. The levels, despite being incredibly long, are awesomely designed. If there was a minimal amount of recycled material between the different stories, just to thread the unique parts together, this may be a great game. I didn't say good, I said great. The controls truthfully kill the experience that the levels want to create. It's like being on a really fun ride while in an uncomfortable seat. You're distracted from what should be fun. The characters with the speed archetype are too fast. While creating a distinction between the power characters and the speed characters, the power characters maintained a fast speed, and the speed characters turned their speed up way past 11 to fuck it levels of speed. Amy runs slower than the other speed characters, and she controls better. There were too many times where I would die because of this. It's most problematic when you're rail grinding. And let's just say that not all characters were built to do that. Ugh. A new mechanic introduced to grinding is switching between rails. By pressing the action button and the direction simultaneously, you can change what rail you're on, which makes it easier to avoid obstacles. But the problem is that it doesn't work. You'll often skip multiple rails and fall off the edge. When the difficulty is being built around rail switching, you're battling both the challenge of the game and the controls. I want to love this game. It looks really good. The levels, despite being really long, are really well designed and allow for almost rhythmic gameplay between the three archetypes. But the controls, the larger enemy health bars, and recycled levels kill the experience. I'm not a game designer, but I really feel like there are only a few things necessary to make this game a great game. Not a good game, a great game. So here are some suggestions. Number one, ditch the four stories. Each set of characters only have a few cutscenes integral to their story, so it's not necessary for them to play through the whole game. If the game had 16 levels instead of 14 levels, you could divide them up evenly amongst the different teams, but then you could go back and find secrets with other teams. Number two, shorten the level length, but short does not mean easy. Team Rose's difficulty was a joke. You can have the game progressively go from decently easy to fucking difficult, but there needs to be progression. Number three, have the speed characters slow down and the power characters too in order to keep a distinction between them. A common question I get is, what is my most hated Sonic game? I really don't think I can truthfully say I hate a Sonic game. It's not like I have a personal relationship with Sonic, but I can say Sonic Heroes is probably the one that bothers me the most. Not because it's the worst game in the Sonic series, but because it lost the most potential. You don't get mad at somebody who's unintelligent, who slacks off and gets bad grades. You get mad at the genius who slacks off and gets average grades. Sonic Heroes is a game that deserves to be above average, but because of the unpolished controls, the recycled content, and the pacing issues, it just balances out to be an incredibly average experience, and it doesn't live up to the caliber it really deserves to. Despite this, reviewing all these Sonic games has given me a more positive outlook on the series. I used to think Sonic was my guilty pleasure, but I realized that from an outside perspective, it's easy to view the Sonic series just as bad. But as someone who's really trying to look at these games objectively, as a Sonic fan, I realize that it's not a guilty pleasure, but it's comfort food. There's nothing to be ashamed of as a Sonic fan. It's just good fun. And nothing can kill that spirit. <laughs> they called it Sonic the Hedgehog. No subtitle, just Sonic the Hedgehog. This is what Sonic was supposed to be, the definitive version. And the worst part is, you open the game and then you see it. His face, just staring back at you. Confident, you're having fun. You're not having fun. <laughs>
I'll take those odds. After Sonic Heroes, Sega released Shadow the Hedgehog, a game that tied directly into the plots of the previous two games, but to believe this plot was planned would be a stretch. By definition, that game is a spin-off, so I'm not talking about it yet. One day. Shadow the Hedgehog was a big departure tonally. Sonic Adventure 2 had some dark elements, Sonic Heroes was completely lighthearted, then Shadow the Hedgehog came back with extreme elements of both, so it was an odd, tonal hodgepodge. And that's just a theme with all of the adventure era games, it's just tonally inconsistent. Shadow the Hedgehog seemingly brought an end to all of the plot points developed since Sonic Adventure 2, so Sega was free to do something new. Sonic the Hedgehog, a phrase in which here refers to a video game from 2006, which shares the name with a much better video game. The game was planned after Sega got a hold of a developer's unit for the Xbox 360, and soon they realized they had unlimited power. In 2005, a trailer leaked and people were actually hyped. The trailer showed Sonic being Sonic, but in HD. This was supposed to be a return to classic form. Once again, for like the billionth time, Sonic 06 was supposed to be the thesis of the adventure era, combining the best aspects, minus the Chow Garden, because reasons. To pay homage to the classics, the game was titled Sonic the Hedgehog. Originally, it was going to be released on the Wii, but Sonic Team split itself up to work on two separate games, Sonic 06 and Sonic and the Secret Rings, another Sonic spin-off. Sega had trouble handling the different consoles, both versions received harsh critique, but the PlayStation 3 version is considered to be inferior. Some of the most uninspiring environment, shoddy controls, and degenerate use of the same stages over and over again by characters even less defined than a Rorschach test. For clarification, I've always had the Xbox 360 version. When I got it, I kind of knew I didn't like it. I couldn't admit it, but it successfully became the first Sonic game that I actively stopped playing. I've done my best to return to the game and beat it, but I've never been completely successful until this review. And even now, it took me months, not because it's difficult, but because I couldn't sit down and marathon it without going crazy. It's no use! New features include a new character named Silver, subtle redesigns to the whole cast, except for Dr. Eggman, who's given a complete overhaul, and the first time a main series Sonic game switched the voice actors, this time utilizing the voice actors from Sonic X. Thanks a lot. I didn't think you could talk. Well, I can do a lot of things. The story is split up into three episodes, Sonic, Silver, and Shadow. Story elements intertwine with each other, so I'm going to do my best not to repeat myself while still making sense of the story. Presenting the story in separate episodes sometimes leads to confusion. But that's the way the game does it, so that's how I'm going to do it. Sonic's story begins with the Princess of Soliana, a country, starting the Festival of the Sun at night. Eggman comes to kidnap her, but Sonic the Hedgehog! Sonic rescues Elise, but he proves that he's no Mario, because Elise gets kidnapped immediately afterwards. Wait, maybe that means he is like Mario. Instead of running after Eggman, Sonic admits that the beach would be a much prettier first level. He even has time to imprison this whale. Sonic gets Elise back and heads to the desert. Relationship development. Your smile. That's all I need. Elise tells Sonic about how Eggman wants to release Solaris, a god who almost killed all of Soliana, and Soliana's food court. Silver confronts Sonic, stating that Sonic will destroy the world, but it's no use! Elise gets captured again. Amy stops Silver from killing Sonic, even though he's the Iblis Trigger. More on that later. Sonic and Tails meet up with Knuckles, who shows Sonic a message from Eggman who says he'll exchange Elise for the Chaos Emeralds. I'm going to assume you mean the Chaos Emeralds. Then they go to Eggman's base on a snowy mountain in the middle of the Mediterranean. Then Sonic 06 nostalgia panders before it was cool, and as they attempt to make the exchange, Eggman sends Sonic and Tails and Knuckles back to the future. Eggman reveals that he needs all seven Chaos Emeralds You mean the Chaos Emeralds? Activate the true power of Solaris. The squad meets up with the Suicide Squad in a destroyed future. They work together to find some Chaos Emeralds, ah! and then Sonic discovers that Elise died a few days after they were sent to the future. They try to go back to the past, but first they have to fight an Alaskan bull worm named Iblis. Using a dual version of Chaos Control, they get back. Sonic rescues Elise and the two have some time to discuss their strictly platonic friendship. Friendship. Sonic gets Elise back to the castle, but Eggman threatens to blow up the country if Elise doesn't give herself up. Silver and Sonic team up to rescue Elise once and for all. The egg carrier crashes, but Sonic time travels to one day earlier. He rescues Elise. More relationship development. Nice smile. 
The Sonic story boils down to Sonic versus Eggman, but they throw in this totally platonic relationship with him and Elise. Any fun tone is totally desaturated. Besides the opening cutscene, you never see Sonic being Sonic. I think the scene that best describes the tonal shift is this one. Don't be late. Same to you. Sonic and Shadow have always had this Goku-Vegeta relationship. They challenge each other, but they enjoy doing it. The plots of Sonic games have never been high quality, but up until this point, they've been fun. When you take all the fun away, all you're left with is a story about anthropomorphic hedgehogs that is nonsensical, boring, and takes itself too seriously. Next, we get the Shadow story. Shadow's story begins with him on a mission to rescue Rouge. By the way, Shadow is now working for Gun, the organization that shot and killed Maria Robotnik, his very own platonic relationship. But Captain America joined Hydra, so okay. Rouge has a staff that's pretty magical. She stole it from Dr. Eggman. Shadow is confronted by a good boy, 10 out of 10. Shadow takes Rouge to a gun rendezvous, but is confronted by Dr. Eggman, which results in the staff shattering, releasing a dark being named Mephilus. Way more hardcore than Shadow, who knows Shadow probably from like Hot Topic or some grimy coffee shop. Mephilus sends Shadow and Rouge to the future. They see E123 Omega, who's half dead. Shadow's a little sad, but he has to live up to society's masculine expectations. Chest hair. Punk Rock meets up with Pop Punk and the same shit happens, but Shadow stays in the future. Shadow fights Mephilus, who has reached his second form. Rouge, in the present, finds Omega and gives him a Chaos Emerald to give to Shadow into the future. Omega sits around for a few hundred years, and we experience it with him because of the loading times. <laughs> With the help of Omega, Shadow returns to the present, and figures out Eggman wanted Mephilus. Shadow confronts Eggman, who tells Shadow about the Solaris Project, some shit that happened 10 years ago. Shadow saves Sonic from Silver, they fight, and then Shadow and Silver go back to the past to find out about that shit that happened 10 years ago. They discover that Elise's dad, the Duke, was working on the Solaris Project. But when the project failed, Mephilus escaped and Iblis was sealed into Elise, only to be released if Elise cries, cause young children never cry. Omega fights Mephilus, Mephilus tells Omega that he was designed to destroy Shadow, the actual lore development that makes sense. Too bad we'll never get a follow up to this seated plotline. Shadow, Rouge, and Omega track Mephilus down into the desert. Shadow removes his inhibitor rings and tries to kick ass, but to be continued. Shadow's story isn't satisfying in any particular way but instead offers insight into the plots of the other two characters. Finally, we get to the Trunks story, I mean the Silver story. Silver is from a dark future where the world has been engulfed by the flames of disaster. Silver and Blaze are essentially firefighters. The two fight Iblis in his erect form, but then Mephilus appears and informs Silver to go back in time and stop the being that caused Iblis to be released. It's Sonic. Silver and Blaze go back in time, Silver sees Sonic, but then Amy sees Sonic. But it's not Sonic, it's Silver. They hang out, get to know each other, Silver tries to kill Sonic in the food court, you know, the usual. But Amy says, absolutely not! You can't kill Sonic because he hasn't done anything yet. Silver questions if he should actually kill Sonic, but ultimately he decides to kill Sonic. He goes to kill Sonic, but Vegeta says, you're no son of mine! And the audience cheers because of this scene. Ah! Chaos Control! Shadow literally freezes time in order to teach this boy a lesson. It's the most extra thing you'll see all day. <gasps> they go back in time, that shit with Elise happens. Silver concludes that Mephilus only wanted him to kill Sonic so that Elise would cry and release Iblis. Silver goes back to the present and helps Sonic rescue Elise. Then Silver and Blaze go into the future to defeat Iblis once and for all. Silver and Blaze fight Iblis and after the fight, Iblis is sealed into Blaze who says, I must go. My home planet needs me and goes into a, another dimension? Either explaining her origin in Sonic Rush or setting up for a Silver sequel we never got. The Silver story is the most complex. It's the only story that directly involves everyone. I know people think Silver is annoying, I don't. I actually like Silver and it's a shame that this was the game he was introduced in. Finally, we get to the end game. Mephilus has apparently escaped Shadow's big attack. Mephilus confronts Sonic and I imagine death so much it feels more like a memory. Just like that, Sonic is dead, creating at least one creepypasta explaining that the rest of Sonic's games are just the afterlife. I am totally unaware of it if it actually exists. Elise cries, releasing Iblis, and Mephilus and Iblis merge to form Solaris, the god of time. 
Elise recognizes that Sonic is probably not dead and asks all of the characters to go fetch the Chaos Emeralds for her. They do! Elise prays to the Chaos Emeralds to bring Sonic back into- Oh. Oh! Oh, their relationship was anything but platonic! And... And... I'm over it! I- I get it that this is weird, and it's weird on so many levels, but truthfully, I'm over it! The reason why it shocked so many people was because this is Sonic the Hedgehog. When you have him rescue the princess and get a kiss at the end of the game, it's kind of contradictive to the character. Because the character was created to literally contradict another character who does just that. Even if this was, say, a hedgehog princess, it would be just as weird. But what evolves it from weird into a notoriously uncomfortable moment is the fact that she's also human. But this game came out over 10 years ago, I'm over it, and you should be too. Eggman explains that Solaris is invincible because it is ever-present, existing in the past, present, and future. Therefore, it cannot be defeated, but they just beat him up like every other boss in the game, which ultimately destroys him. Okay. Elise and Sonic then get the opportunity to blow out Solaris's flame, which would prevent Solaris's destruction, but also prevent Sonic and Elise from meeting each other. Elise says, I don't care if everyone dies. Even if Elise was a likable character before this moment, she just ruined all of that. What a selfish thing to say. Sonic understands that Elise has become a little too clingy and decides to break up with her in the most satisfying way possible. He changes the course of history so that they would have never met, erasing their relationship in the entire events of the game. The denouement of the game is literally a self-contained apology for its own existence. Magnificent. As a standalone story, I don't believe Sonic 06's plot structure is any better or worse than previous Sonic games. There are a few too many cringe moments in the story which distract from the plot itself, but the main problems stem from the tone. Sonic 06's plot has this sense of importance that doesn't belong in a Sonic the Hedgehog game. The Iblis Trigger must die! Sonic. The moments everyone remembers in this game are the ones where the characters were betraying what was previously established. Sonic falling in love. When we see him acting all smooth, it's bizarre. Shadow becomes a gun agent. This is the game that turned Knuckles from the cool kid with a temper into an idiot. But here it's not played for laughs, it's just kind of awkward. Look at this scene. Knuckles throws Sonic a message from Eggman in the most unnecessarily cool kid way, but when Sonic throws it back, he clumsily drops it. It's animated in a silly way, but nobody reacts to it. It just sort of happens. Eggman, who's this silly ass looking character, is given this creepy redesign. Mike Pollock, who is excellent as the character, is holding himself back. Eggman Land will finally come to be! It's too powerful for you to overcome. He has this silly voice, but his delivery is dead serious. The game also has this weird relationship with the rest of Sonic's canon. It kind of ignores and simultaneously expects the audience to be familiar with it. I've thought about this game and its story a lot but I've never really truly understood what the story was trying to accomplish. You don't call it a Sonic boom for nothing. Sonic is reborn for the next generation, and this time, speed won't be enough. It'll take an all-out force of nature. Sonic the Hedgehog, enter the Sonic Age. There are multiple different play styles in the game, with the main ones being Sonic, Shadow, and Silver. Sonic's gameplay does its best to replicate the feeling of the adventure games. It fails. Whoa! Although Sonic does control decently well when this game, this fickle game, allows, most of the time the game suffers from slowdown, having to stop to drain enemy health bars, long levels, and switching to Sonic's friends, Tails, and Knuckles. In certain levels, Sonic runs fast, but like way faster than usual. So fucking fast that when he bumps into something, buh bye an object in motion will stay in motion. Sonic's final gameplay style is when he's holding Elise. Those big, cartoony hedgehog hands on a realistically proportioned body. It's not as awful as I remember it being. The only ability Sonic loses is his spin dash, and all I have to say to that is, he still has a spin dash. Sonic highlights, being able to walk upside down, having to walk on a metal ball, avoiding everything. Snowboarding in White Acropolis. I would love to say that the mechanics of the board are broken, but I don't think they programmed anything into this. Up, down, left, and right are all optional inputs that could mean anything. Every mock speed section. Avoiding enemies is difficult enough, but precision platforming is almost impossible, yet highly necessary. If you miss a jump, you're dead. And the goddamn battle with Silver. Oh my god, the battle with Silver. No, 
This is a special sort of awful. During the fight, Silver uses his psychic powers to hold Sonic and throw him against the wall. As you recover, he picks you up again and does it again. Sometimes you'll pick up your ring over and over, creating a cycle of never-ending torment. And every time he grabs you, it's no use! 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 Instead of side characters having their own campaign, they're integrated into gameplay. Tails no longer has his tail whip attack, and instead having the dummy ring ability from Sonic Heroes, it keeps awkwardly cutting to this first-person point of view. And Tails' flight mechanics are just awful. His forward momentum can be ridiculous sometimes, but as soon as he gets tired, he just drops. All that forward momentum stops. Knuckles can punch and glide, which is all good and well, but his climbing is broken as shit. Half the time, he can't even leave the wall correctly. You just press A over and over again and hope for the best. Shadow's playstyle has just enough differences between him and Sonic to make him unique. The focus is more on combat, so it's not as bad when you run into an enemy with a lot of health. Shadow's got vehicles! Yeah, I do my best to avoid the vehicles. You have the gun buggy, which the only way I can explain how it controls is through this visual aid. You have the glider and the hovercraft that are forgettable, and then the motorcycle, which is the worst, but also the most necessary to use. You get the motorcycle when trying to run down a train, and Shadow's not fast enough on foot, I tried. So you're stuck with it. Shadow's playable friends are Rouge and Omega. Rouge has the same gliding and climbing mechanics as Knuckles, but instead of punching, she has a bomb that operates the same as Tails' bomb. Omega sort of plays how he did in Sonic Heroes, but the aim seems to be way off. Silver. Lovable, innocent Silver. He slowed down. Way, way down. Silver doesn't rely on physical attacks, but his own psychic attacks. Silver can defeat enemies by throwing shit and other enemies at them, but he can only throw enemies when they're stunned. I feel like Silver would have been cool if he was this super overpowered character, except he's not. It's this slow, boring gameplay style that is incredibly limited. Once you start holding more than one object, your aim starts to suck really bad. Instead of limiting characters' established powers, create a game that is designed to challenge that power. Highlights. The desert level where he has to direct a ball into a hole. You can only hit the ball nine times before it explodes, and if you try to take your time and carefully plan on where it's gonna go, it explodes. This usually takes about a half hour to do, and it's so frustrating. And when it's finally over, there's no satisfaction because you remember your reward is getting to play more of this game. Great. Silver's friends are Blaze and Amy. A lot of people consider Blaze to be the best controlled character in the entire game, and I can definitely see that argument, but she's incredibly underutilized. Amy could turn invisible. I'm legitimately asking now. Did I miss another part of the canon where this had happened before? Has this been explained at any point? Besides that, she's slow, and using her hammer is nearly impossible because she stops dead in her tracks whenever she pulls it out. Now, I could easily nitpick, riff on, and make fun of different moments in this game for hours. It's truthfully a mess. But I really do think there needs to be a distinguishing factor between individual moments that I can make fun of and moments that actually help support the message of my review. That being said, now I want to talk about qualities of the game that are shared between all of the characters. When a ton of enemies are on screen, the game slows down. Sometimes it feels unplayable. It's easy to get lost. At times, I just couldn't figure out where to go. Sometimes I would end up going in circles because the level's design made it look like I was linearly progressing, only to say nope. After building this expectation of getting lost, Aquatic Base actually has repeating sections. After building this expectation, I assumed once again that I was going in circles, which resulted in me going in circles. Certain boss battles are just confusing as hell. During the Egg Cerberus fight, you have to hold on to his face rod and guide him into a wall, but sometimes it won't work, and guiding him is confusing as all heck. The character boss battles are built weakly yet again, and the levels are long-winded. It is so discouraging to get a game over and have to track back through the level after playing for almost an hour. I had to take so many sanity breaks that it's taken me over three months to play through the game. Man, today's not my day! Finally, the last section of the game ends of the world. Although it definitely was frustrating, it's really forgiving because of the amount of extra lives you receive. And Rouge can just fly straight to the end of her portion. Like, no joke, I found the end of this level completely by accident. The final boss is incredibly easy, and if this was a good game, it would definitely be a letdown. Once you figure out how to beat it, all you have to do is pay attention to the character's ring count. Just like in Sonic Adventure, there's an overworld, Soliana. Immediately after the game starts, Sonic is just dropped directly into the overworld. No action stage or boss to start off. Throughout Soliana, there are a ton of tedious little challenges you can take. If you're not trying to 100% the game, only a few are necessary. Just like another masterpiece, the first challenge Sonic has to do is jump through a bunch of rings. 
These challenges are frustrating, mostly because of the game's loading. To be clear, I've only completed the challenges necessary to finish the game's story mode. My favorite one has to be Find the Guard Captain. An ordinary, definitely not the Captain of the Guard guard, tells you in order to access a level, you need to guess which one of these guards is the Captain. The game loads, he explains the challenge, the game loads again, who could the Captain be? Let's see if the guy who initially came up with the challenge has any clues. Oh, he's the Captain of the Guard, wow. S ranking, loading, mission done. This is the most unnecessary thing I've ever seen. Soliana in its entirety just feels unnecessary. I get that they wanted to invoke the feelings of Sonic Adventure, but the difference is that Station Square is small and easy to get around in, and it helps you understand where the levels are in relation to the game's location. Not Soliana, it's large. Instead of going for a charming and easy to navigate city, it's aiming for realism and architectural consistency. I get lost in Soliana because it all looks the same. Bland and white, or bland and green. My favorite part is this large grassy area. Look at all this stuff to do! Seeing Sonic run around real looking people clashes with his design. But to be fair, the people only look real when they're not moving. And they can only make a few different sounds. Hey, 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 hey. Soliana, it's a place. There's no issue with finding enjoyment out of this game. Personally, I don't, and I really believe that it's a bad game. A lot of people argue that if it wasn't rushed, it would have been amazing. But I really disagree. People cite the glitches, the story, and the load time for the game's lack of quality, but all of that wouldn't matter if the game was fundamentally enjoyable. The glitches. Yes, there are glitches in this game. Bad glitches. But I rarely found the glitches to be the source of my discontent. If it were an enjoyable game from the ground up, the glitches would be celebrated. Look at Pokemon. The original games are full of glitches, but people still love it. The story and the load times would simply be annoyances if the game was fundamentally good. The major problem is the buggy gameplay, but that's just an umbrella term. Walking upside down, vehicle control, slow down, lack of sound effects, lack of graphical effects, visual glitches, aiming problems, physics breaking, the camera. If the game ran perfectly, if all the little problems with it were fixed, you'd still have the tonally off story. You'd still have Soliana and its problems. Sega's track record would mean that the camera would still be bad. Silver would still be extremely boring. You'd still get lost inside all of the stages. There would still be the awkward mix between realistic humans and Sonic characters. Eggman would still look like this. This game has become the negative stereotype of Sonic games that is reinforced by other Sonic games. This didn't come out of nowhere. It was an evolution of the adventure series. More on that later. First, I have to talk about a question that I've had. I've been trying to figure out why people continue to defend this game, and I'm truthfully not asking that in a rhetorical sense, but I'm genuinely curious. I approach critiquing media by knowing how it makes me feel, but then I need to pinpoint exactly why I think it makes me feel that way. I've also made flawed conclusions based off of this tactic, like saying I didn't like Sonic 3's art because it's too cartoony. What I should have said is it's bubbly when compared to the sleeker designs of previous games. Now, what I've determined is that enjoyment of this game comes exclusively to Sonic fans. Sonic fans attempt to group the series into different eras. The way I see it, Sonic Adventure, Sonic Adventure 2, Sonic Heroes, Shadow the Hedgehog, and Sonic the Hedgehog 2006 all belong in the same group. They share similar gameplay and storylines. However, Sonic 06 does stand on its own in a really bizarre way. It's a half reboot that attempts to carry over the best aspects of the adventure games. But the real carryovers are everything people didn't want. The poor camera, the overworld, the overcomplex story, the slowdown, enemy health bars, only being able to play a supersonic in the final stage. These are all complaints I've had in my reviews of previous Sonic games. But here, it's all together in this poorly wrapped package. However, I think the fact that these flaws have repeated themselves from previous Sonic games helps some Sonic fans enjoy this game in a unique way. In the past, when I've attempted to play this game, I've hated it. But now, as I'm doing this Sonic overview, that hatred has shrunk a little bit. It was as if every game before this was me training to deal with all of these problems separately. That doesn't redeem the game, but I think I get the perspective of people who like it. Sonic 06 wants to be a game for people who grew up with the adventure games, but that concept came too soon. So much of what Sonic operates off of, in fact, so much of what media relies on is nostalgia. 
but nostalgia is created through time. Sonic 06 came out only a few years after Adventure 2. If 06 were released today with all of its buggy problems fixed and a tweak in tone for the story, people would love it. It wants to be that perfect nostalgia game for those who grew up with the Adventure series. But the problem, aside from everything I've discussed, is the fact that those who grew up with the Adventure series were still growing up. I was 10 when this game came out, and despite Sonic being such an important part of my early childhood, I couldn't convince myself that I was enjoying the game. Sonic 06's biggest offense is that it came out too soon, and I mean that on multiple levels. It was rushed to meet a holiday deadline, which resulted in most of the bugs and errors you see in the game, but even if the game ran perfectly, and the story itself actually felt like a Sonic the Hedgehog story, the audience that aimed to please just didn't exist yet. After the failure of Sonic 06, Sonic creator Yuji Naka resigned from Sonic Team to form his own company. Learning from their mistakes, Sega gave Sonic Team free reign and no time constraints to produce the next Sonic game in the series. During the development of Sonic 06, Sega was already looking forward. As early as 2006, Sega had began work on the Hedgehog engine. The Hedgehog engine compressed animation and game assets in order to allow for faster action. Consider it modern day blast processing. The Sega Genesis has blast processing. Super Nintendo doesn't. So what's blast processing do? Motion blur, particle, and lighting effects were all enabled by its development. Sonic Adventure 3 was intended to be the first Sonic game to use this engine. During Adventure 3's development, focus began to shift solely to Sonic. Although Sonic was redesigned in 1998, his model changed from game to game. So, designer Sachiko Kawamura was tasked with creating a uniform Sonic model that would be recognizable to all players. A balance was found between classic and modern Sonic. Personally, I love the way this iteration of the character looks. And even to this day, this is the model that Sega uses for Sonic the Hedgehog. Eventually, the title was dropped in favor of Sonic World Adventure. The game would see Sonic travel to real-world inspired locations. Although Sonic became the sole focus, the director of the game wanted to surprise players by making Sonic a little bit more wild than usual. This birthed the concept of the Werehog, a transformation Sonic would undergo at night. It's a shame they didn't go with this design because he's the floofiest! This new transformation led to another title change, Sonic Unleashed, but the title remained Sonic World Adventure in Japan. Sonic Unleashed was released worldwide in November of 2008. By day, he runs rings around the world. But when night falls, things get a little hairy. New features include a song by the lead singer from Bowling for Soup. Bowling for Soup! A revamped gameplay style featuring the Quick Step, which allows Sonic to quickly move from side to side. The Boost, which replaces Sonic's traditional spin dash. A Stomp ability, which allows Sonic to slam himself directly downward. Bowling for Soup! And a revised homing attack, which uses a button separate from the jump button and features a new target for accurate jumping. Gameplay switching from 2D to 3D perspectives, and a completely new play style as the Werehog. I've never really been a fan of Sonic Unleashed. When the game came out, my Xbox would frequently red ring, and I remember getting bored with the Werehog stages. Between my boredom and the Xbox I owned being a pain in the ass to use, I just sort of dropped it. But here we go. The game begins with Sonic boarding Eggman's spaceship fleet. In space. Sonic kicks ass at what has got to be the coolest opening to any Sonic game yet. Eggman is confronted by Sonic, but he's like, I got you! Sonic then reveals he had the Chaos Emeralds the whole time, and turns super. Eggman's like, oh no, but then he was like, it was a ruse, as he traps Sonic, and Sonic's like, ah. Eggman drains the Chaos Emeralds of their power and fires a super weapon toward the Earth. The Earth just, like, shatters, which releases a sleepy being known as Dark Gaia. Eggman's really happy about this. Dark Gaia's release causes Sonic to transform into the Werehog. Eggman unleashes Sonic out of the ship, and the title shows up at the perfect time. He was just unleashed! Sonic plummets to Earth and lands on this cute thing who has amnesia. Sonic eventually names him Chip in reference to his discovered love for chocolate. Sonic sees that Tails is in danger, and he rescues him while in werehog form. Tails is like, ah, but Sonic is like, no, dude, I'm so cool. Tails introduces Sonic to Professor Pickle, who explains that in order to put the world back together, get Sonic back to normal, get the band back together, and get Chip's memory back, Sonic and Chip must place the Chaos Emeralds inside several temples around the world. Sonic and Chip collect Gaia keys to unlock the temples and place the emeralds inside. 
which restores the world. After six of the seven pieces of the world are put back together, Chip begins to regain his memory. He remembers that he is Light Gaia, a being that battles with Dark Gaia every few million years or so. Dark Gaia tears the world apart, Light Gaia puts it back together. It's sort of their alternative to Puzzle Knight. The reason why Chip had amnesia is because Eggman woke them up too early. Sonic and Chip infiltrate Eggman Land, which is surrounding the final temple. Eggman releases Dark Gaia and demands that it crushes Sonic. But once again, Eggman is betrayed by a giant fucking monster. Once Chip and Sonic are ready to meet their end, Chip calls upon the power of all the temples, along with the Chaos Emeralds to build a giant fucking mech. Sonic turns super and the final battle ensues. Chip saves Sonic and they go back to sleep for the next million years or so. Sonic keeps Chip's necklace in remembrance and runs off with Tails because Chip was just his side bag. I have to admit, I enjoyed the game's story. My overviews are just to give context so I can't recreate its charm. Part of the reason the story works is because of Chip. His optimism and quirkiness helps keep levity to what is already a bizarre story. <laughs> Look at his little camera. I mean, the Werehog concept is ridiculous, but I've grown more accepting of the concept itself. I mean, just regular Sonic is bizarre when you think about it long enough. It's relieving to get a story that's not split into separate chapters and it's able to shine because of it. Sonic being forced to help Chip allows the game to tell Chip's story while keeping Sonic involved. Here's the thing about Sonic stories. Sonic is a brand icon. Having true character development means you change the character. Just look at the one time they tried to do it. I know a big complaint with the series has been that there are too many characters, but adding a character to the game allows there to be a character-driven story. People remember Shadow, Silver, and Chip because they were the main characters of the games they were introduced in. Sonic is just sort of the vehicle to tell their story. These would-be one-off characters allow for the games to have a story without conflicting with the main cast. And here's a simple thing I noticed about this game, and maybe it was an idea Sega had if they continued with plot-heavy Sonic games. Water, fire, earth, we're only missing one elemental giant fucking monster. Although I enjoyed the story, I was often taken out of it due to the voice acting. The conversation of Griffith versus Drummond is a conversation for another day, but Chip. I'm not a purist. I'll never listen to a Japanese dub unless I'm just curious about it. But listen to Chip's English voice actor. What is my name? Ah, I don't know. I can't remember. Now his Japanese voice actor. What happened? He was adorable. I think Sonic's protective nature and immediate desire to help Chip works better if Chip is perceived as a little kid. Even the name Chip works better because of his love for chocolate. It becomes so much cuter. But when all is said and done, the story works for what it is. If you want to get a taste of the story's fun and quirky tone, check out Night of the Werehog, a short that was produced by Sega's Marza Studios that is actually helping with the animation for the Sonic the Hedgehog movie, which is scheduled to come out next year. Here's something interesting. There was actually a Sonic Unleashed game for mobile. I mean like, flip phone mobile. It was officially licensed by Sega and developed by Gameloft. It featured custom sprite art for both Sonic and the Werehog. Unfortunately, it's very hard to track down. The more you know. Throughout the game, Sonic travels the world and visits different countries all based off of real world locations. Every country has its own unique look which is complemented by the game's art design. I mean this game is gorgeous! The colors are bright, the environments have personality, particle effects give a huge sense of action, and motion blurring, although excessive, at times really works. The only thing bad I have to say about how this game looks is a complaint I have for all Sonic games that use the Hedgehog engine. The lighting effects give the characters a weird color. Either they're too heavily reflecting the color of their environment, or their color is just washed out entirely. Sonic Unleashed features two different playstyles, Sonic and the Werehog. During the day you play as Sonic, and at night, Time passes naturally with your progression of the game, but you can also control the day to night transition.
Each country has at least one day and one nighttime stage with additional and optional acts becoming available as you continue to progress through the game. Although the game has a linear progression, you don't just go from country to country. You're constantly traveling back and forth to complete objectives. For example, when you get to Empire City, only the night level is immediately available. Once you complete a level in Shamar, you go back to Empire City and the daytime level becomes available. This is an example of an overworld done right. The villages are charming and easy to navigate, and the hub world area provides an opportunity to learn and practice new skills. But because the game doesn't always hold your hand, sometimes figuring out where to go next can be really confusing. The daytime stages is really where this game shines. This is the first time where Sonic has felt right in 3D. From the get-go, Sonic is incredibly fast. This is what the mock sections in Sonic 06 wanted to do. It's crisp and new gameplay mechanics address the problems of past Sonic games. Before, the high-speed sections were just there as a reward for playing the game well. But now, it's an active mechanic. The quick step, quick time events for tricks, and the boost mechanic all help the player remain active while moving fast. However, if you hold down the boost for extended periods, it sort of puts the game back on rails. But ironically, you still need to stay active while using the boost even on rails. When Sonic's running, he controls great, but when you're trying to platform or take it slow, he's sort of slippery. I kind of wish there was a button I could press just to slow him down, because in the village sections where Sonic can't run, slower Sonic controls great. This isn't a problem too much, because a lot of the platforming sections don't even take place in 3D. Instead, heavy platforming segments seamlessly transition into a 2D perspective. The 2D segments help break up the speed and is a great way to deal with the inherent problems of 3D platforming. The game also fixes past problems I've had with boss battles. Boss battles have always been a weak point for Sonic. 2D boss battles will slow down the action and 3D boss battles would always be screwed because of the camera. Sonic Unleashed takes the concept of running boss battles from heroes and, well, runs with it. Avoiding enemy attacks and hurting the boss are integrated into the game naturally. All in all, the daytime stages rock. There was seriously not a single stage that I didn't enjoy. Up until now, 3D Sonic games have always been experimental, but Sonic Unleashed is the first game to really have Sonic comfortably fit into this perspective. There's constant movement and active participation within the gameplay. No question, it's some of the best Sonic stages in the history of the character. It's the nighttime stages that present a problem. Sonic the fucking Werehog. Instead of fast action being at the center of attention, combat and platforming becomes the focus. The combat system is pretty well made, with a combination of easy to perform special moves and quick time events based on combos. Beating up a bunch of bad guys can feel pretty good and experimenting with the combos can be fun. And then you play the game for more than two minutes. What happened with my experience is I found one easy combo that worked and I ran with it. Or in this case, I briskly walked with it. When I got bored of pressing Y over and over, I just press X over and over. The problem isn't inherently with the Werehog itself, it just overstays its welcome. Levels regularly last around 20 minutes because you have to kill pretty much every enemy to progress. Screens will regularly be stuffed with tons of baddies, and besides the occasional boss, all the bad guys can be beaten just by punching and kicking. Kicking? I want to do some kicking! Sometimes I would just browse the internet while spamming the Y button until all the enemies were gone. The only time where I had to pay strict attention was in the Halaska stage, which takes place on ice. While fighting, every punch will make you slide slightly, so you have to simultaneously fight while watching where you're standing. Besides boss battles, this is the only point in the game where I really had to pay attention as the Werehog. The combat system is built well, but there's no reason to learn it. Using complex combos is just as effective as pressing the same button over and over again. While the platforming is solid, it's hard to enjoy when all you want to do is finish the level. The thought of getting a game over and having to restart a level is terrifying and extremely stressful. The Werehog stages are a chore. This is an example of gameplay being bad, not because it's glitchy or buggy, but because it's boring. I truthfully believe the Werehog could have been handled well, but the levels need to be shorter and I need an incentive to learn the combo system. But instead, it's repetitive and does nothing but make me wish I was playing the other part of the game. Ever since Sonic Adventure, Sonic games have had this air of self-consciousness. The core Sonic gameplay is never enough. There always needs to be unnecessary variety. Variation in gameplay can be good when it complements the formula, like in Sonic 3 and Knuckles, but when it's just there to be different, it doesn't help the game. The Werehog concept itself isn't fundamentally broken, it's the execution that's broken. It could easily complement the formula, but the level length and tedious repetition makes it boring. The repetition is just reinforced by the music. Every time you fight a large amount of enemies, <laughs> It's 
shame because I'm a big fan of that glitzy, ritzy swing music. An example of it working is in the boss battles. It's never just beating up the enemy, there's always a little puzzle to it. When the Werehog is engaging, it works, but the problem is, it's almost never engaging. Stop lifting with your back! Lift with your legs! Speaking of chores, you can't just continue through the game by beating levels. You have to collect sun and mood medals to unlock stages, which essentially results in replaying the same levels over and over again. By the end of the game, you need 120 of the sun medals, meaning I had to play for hours just to unlock one stage. This process killed my enjoyment of the game. Each level has anywhere from one to 10 medals. Toward the end of the game, I needed to go back and scan through every level, meaning, uh-oh, more fucking Werehog. It's overkill. That's my recurring criticism of the game. It milks itself dry. Luckily, you don't have to complete a level in order to collect the medals. You can just collect it and quit. And the game tries to aid you by allowing you to level up Sonic Strength and other attributes, which tries to make playing through the earlier stages slightly easier. So this is the first time I've ever finished Sonic Unleashed. And despite all of the game's flaws, which ruined the experience of playing through the game for me, I'm glad I played it. I mean, bowling for soup! But the reward of the game's completion is the fact that you get a stage select. Being able to now revisit Sonic Unleashed and ignore all of the bullshit makes it worth it. But I also think that's why people so strongly defend this game. When you have the opportunity to ignore the aspects of a game that make it bad, and yeah, these aspects truthfully makes playing through the game bad. You start to warp your opinion on the game in its entirety. Despite the fact that the story and the presentation is really nice, playing through the campaign is long, and arduous. Effort and experimentation was clearly poured into this game, but the thing about experimenting is it doesn't always work. I appreciate the attempt to do something new, especially because they really try, but the repetition dulls the aspects of the game that is truly great. But being able to skip all of that makes it worth it, but you shouldn't have to beat a game before you can enjoy it. Unfortunately, the legacy of Unleashed is outweighed by its bad qualities. Only two years after its release, Sega delisted all Sonic games with a low or below average Metacritic score. Sonic Unleashed was amongst several games that went out of print in an attempt to rebuild Sonic's brand value. Many Sonic fans consider the period from Shadow of the Hedgehog to Sonic 06 to be a dark age for Sonic. I mean back-to-back -back games which were critically panned. During this time, it was really discouraging to be a Sonic fan. But I think it's a little unfair to group Sonic Unleashed in this dark age. Because despite the fact that playing through the actual game is a terrible experience, it laid the groundwork for the Sonic brand to begin to rebuild itself. Between Sonic 06 and Sonic Unleashed, Sonic fans were clamoring for something they could celebrate. And in September of 2009, it felt as if Sega had an answer. Project Needle Mouse was a mysterious game which promised to finally return Sonic back to his roots. Properly. <laughs> Named after Sonic's conceptual name from way back when, Project Needle Mouse aimed to give fans from the Genesis era a game they could appreciate. Over the months, Sega used their social media pages to tease fan theories and distribute small details about the game. Over the course of a few days, a playable character countdown was featured, slowly, one by one, eliminating all of the characters playable in the game until only Sonic was left. For the first time since Sonic 1, Sonic would be the only playable character. Please, if there's some obscure Sonic game where he's the only playable character, don't use that as a single example to dismantle my argument. Be intelligent! I'm sure you could dismantle it in another way. Finally, in February of 2010, the title of the game was announced. Sonic 4, Episode 1. People went nuts. Ugh! I'm so infuriated right now! This is a complete turn-off! It's, it's incredibly misleading! I, along with most people in their late 20s, was expecting the classic-style Black-Eyed Sonic! This is... Oh wait, that's Tails. <laughs> so stressed out I can't even concentrate. But for a more accurate picture of how people reacted, here's a scene from when a mystery game was announced at Screw Attack's Iron Man of Gaming in the summer of 2010.
Besides those lucky enough to play it at SGC, fans would have to wait until October to get their hands on the game. When it was released, Sonic 4 Episode 1 was met with decent reception. I'm sure it wasn't the smash hit that Sega had hoped for, but both fans and critics agreed, it all right. What do you mean, it all right? The game is definitely not bad, it's just not the love letter to the classics that I was hoping for. At this point, Sonic 3 had already cemented itself as my favorite Sonic game. So to get a promise to a return to glory and get something more akin to bubblegum pop, well, it was a little disappointing. New features include being able to select stages and acts in any order. That's all. Nothing about this game is really new. The story, Sonic vs. Eggman, okay, let's go. Each level in the game is visually modeled after an older stage. You have Good Value Green Hill Zone, Walmart Brand Labyrinth Zone, just off enough to avoid copyright infringement Casino Night Zone, and finally, Metro Polis Zone. Despite the visuals, a lot of the ideas presented are new. Sure, you get your loopy loops and squiggly squigs, but pattern recognitions, balancing on big rocks, and some sick timed puzzle solving helps to make these old locations seem anew. What also helps is the fact that some of the fundamental gameplay is changed. When Sonic Adventure came out, the homing attack was introduced in order to replicate the feeling of bouncing off enemies in a 2D space. When Sonic 4 came around, it took that move created specifically for 3D game mechanics and put it in a 2D space. Both the spin attack and the jump attack are rendered useless because of the homing attack. Bouncing off enemies is significantly harder anyways because when Sonic is launched into the air, he doesn't form into a ball, but instead keeps his arms out, which makes him vulnerable to attacks from... Nunu. Sonic's acceleration seems off too. His walking cycle up until he starts running feels floaty, and even when he is running, there's not a lot of weight to him. But that doesn't matter because when the game wants you to move fast, it does it for you, with lots of springs and boosters. Sonic 4 does not encourage exploration. It takes nothing but holding the controller and moving forward to beat it. It's an obnoxiously easy game in hindsight and a dull experience while playing it. The game itself feels cheap, and it's a feeling that's cemented by poor cell shading and gameplay that fails to replicate the classic games. 2D Sonic games in the past make you use your environments to gain top speed and practice the levels to learn how to maintain that speed. Here, that first half is removed. Rarely is the environment the source of your speed. In fact, like many 3D Sonic games, Sonic can just start moving at his top speed by himself. The times where speed has been necessary in past games is to travel up a wall. But, Wow. Visually, the game itself looks alright, but it's cheap. The cell shading, which I believe is trying to emulate a 2D style, just makes the game look like plastic. It's all visually pleasing, but these are designs I've seen before rendered out to look cheaper. The fact that they didn't use the classic Sonic model isn't the worst thing in the world, but the more I play this game, the more I feel as if they didn't use the classic Sonic model because they either weren't allocated the resources, or they just didn't feel like it. A lot of Sonic's personality is drained. The only pieces of animation that stick out to me is when his arms are wide open because vulnerability, and his exaggerated looking up animation, which I have to admit is really cute. Sonic 4 Episode 1 is a game that tries to invoke the feelings of the classic Sonic the Hedgehog games, but besides some visual cues, it's too far away from the classics to warrant being called Sonic 4 but it's not too far away enough to feel like its own thing. Sonic 4 Episode 1 was developed by Dimps, a studio that was responsible for the Sonic Advance and Sonic Rush series. After playing Sonic 4, I would have much rather have seen an HD console version of Sonic Rush. I feel as if they could have done something really special. Instead, what we're left with is a poor, cheap imitation. After a year and a half, we'd finally see the release of Sonic 4 Episode 2. If you collected all seven Chaos Emeralds in Episode 1, a to-be-continued screen was shown with a silhouette of Metal Sonic. And as a callback to Sonic and Knuckles, there was a lock-on bonus if you owned both Episode 1 and 2 of Sonic 4. You could play the Metal episode. A four-act abridged playthrough of Sonic 4 as Metal Sonic. Eggman resurrects Metal after the fight that happened in Sonic CD, and he plays through some levels. Surprisingly, Metal feels better than Sonic, because that floaty gameplay feels fine, because he's literally floating. <sighs> I'm bored. I can't watch this anymore. Stop! There's an easier way! We compare your progressive direct rate to other top companies so you get a great price. Oh! <laughs>
Wouldn't you love to see the world through his eyes? I bet I look like the strongest man in the world. Sonic 4 Episode 1 and Episode 2 were released for nearly every major console, and they both received a mobile port. Oddly enough, this is also the port that was released on the Ouya. Sonic's model is no longer cell shaded and I suspect that if we ever got a re-release, this would be the version. Also, please have Christian Whitehead remaster it. Between Sonic 4 Episode 1 and Episode 2, one year and seven months passed. Two Sonic games were released including Sonic Generations, a game which paid tribute to all the main series Sonic games. <laughs> but whoops, no Sonic 4. It was just kind of ignored. Finally, the weekend that Sonic 4 Episode 2 was released came along and I was so pumped. Finally, after years of anticipation and waiting, I went to go see the Avengers. I mean, it was flawed, but it was so much fun. I mean, kablammo! I think when Avengers Age of Ultron came out, that initial excitement was gone. Personally, I think Age of Ultron improved on the original a lot, but it just didn't have that initial wow factor. I'm so smart, look at me, I'm making such good analogies. Like five years later, I finally got around to episode two. First thing I noticed above all else is the fact that the cell shading is gone, and it looks so good. <laughs> look at that sunset. Well, episode one was reliant on the past Episode 2 doesn't use themes from past Sonic games except for a single stage. Where Episode 1 did the best to invoke the feelings of the first Sonic game, Episode 2 tries to take elements from Sonic 2 and Sonic CD. Tails, Metal Sonic! But Episode 2 is also able to stand on its own because of unique bosses, level aesthetic, and Sonic and Tails can do these tag team moves, Tails can lift Sonic, they can do this big attack which kills all the enemies on the screen, and they can do a... Uh... I like the first two, and to be honest, I use the lift ability sometimes just to see the cute animation between the two of them. But this spin dash move just shoots them in a single direction. You can't stop them. This problem becomes evident when fighting against the oil desert zone boss. You need to hit his feet toward the end of the fight, and most of my challenge was just making sure I was going in the right direction. Episode 2 is also significantly harder than Episode 1, which was one of the easiest games I've played in a while. Most of the challenge comes from moments where if you make a single mistake, instant death. The moment that frustrated me the most was one of White Park Zone's enemies. Well, they're more like obstacles. These walruses blow huge bubbles made of ice. Once they're made, you can't break them, you can only go around them. There's one moment where two of them will prevent you from moving forward and you'll be stuck underwater. So the only thing you can do if they blow bubbles before you get past them is to let Sonic drown and try again. I hate seeing him drown. Another highlight is within the first Metal Sonic encounter. Metal Sonic will often shoot these energy attacks which can be avoided, but then after he's done that a few times, he'll attack you and destroy the ground from below. The way I tried to avoid this was by using the tag team lift, but it rarely worked, it just gave me a moment to realize that I really screwed up. Sonic 4 Episode 2 fixed a lot of the problems with Sonic's control, but the levels in the game rarely allow you to experience the fixed control. Because look, more springs and more boosters. Let's count! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Overall, I do think that episode two is slightly better because even if the challenge is a little cheaper, I'm more actively playing it. Sonic 4 Episode 2 ends with Sonic and Tails stranded in space. There's no to be continued because Sega didn't know if they were gonna make an Episode 3. The original plan with Sonic 4 was to do a complete trilogy. Eventually, plans for Episode 3 were scrapped. With Episode 1 taking heavy influence from Sonic the Hedgehog 1 and Episode 2 taking influence from CD in 2, could have been assumed that Episode 3 would have taken heavy influence from Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles. Although I would have liked to see Episode 3, I don't think it would have been anything special. And who knows how long it would have taken to come out. To do this episodic release was an experiment, but I don't think it's appropriate to experiment with a game called Sonic 4. The idea was to do a back to basics approach, but both episodes failed to recapture the feeling of the original games, and most of it feels too bland to stand on its own. One thing that leaves a bad taste in my mouth when it comes to the Sonic the Hedgehog series is how reactionary 
it all seems. Sonic was created to compete with Mario. After Final Fantasy VII was a smash hit worldwide, Sonic Adventure had RPG elements. In an age of dark and gritty reboots, Shadow the Hedgehog and Sonic 06 were the next steps for the series. Sonic 4 does not feel like a game Sega thought would be a good idea, but rather a game that Capcom thought was a good idea. In 2008, Capcom released Mega Man 9, after years of not having a classic 2D Mega Man. It used retro graphics, retro music, and carefully marketed itself as a love letter to classic fans. And it was released as a downloadable game. Sega took this idea, but stopped at the title. If these games were released under another name, they'd just be alright games. You know, a fun experience you can have for an afternoon. But because they carelessly titled the game Sonic the Hedgehog 4, and even more carelessly planned an episodic release, what we're left with is an incomplete experience which had to live up to expectations that it could not fulfill. We had a lot of faith in what you had to show. And you let me and this poor guy down. In 2010, Sonic 4 gathered so much hype that Sonic Colors went under the radar. But when Sonic 4 turned out to be a slight disappointment, people were like, what's this? Sonic Colors was a response to both the criticism of the more gimmicky Sonic games that preceded it, and the newly gained audience from the popularity of the Wii in the Sonic and Mario series. Being a Wii exclusive, the game was designed to appeal to the Mario fanbase. Level to level, a world map would be seen, and the storyline was written to appeal to a much younger fanbase. Needless to say, hiring the writing staff for both Mad World and Happy Tree Friends resulted in a bit of a bland storyline, when there was no blood or guts anywhere. But the gameplay was designed to appeal to a much wider audience. New features include a brand new voice cast again. He loves to hear his own lips flap, but I gotta hand it to the eggster. This place is epic. They're pretty good. And power-ups called the Wisps. Wisps? No. <laughs> so funny. I got Sonic Colors pretty close to when it was released. I was pumped to finally play another good Sonic game, and I enjoyed it, and never looked back. Oddly enough, every time I've played this game, it's been with the classic controller. This thing is awful. The button layout is completely different than any other Sonic game, so I kept dying from pressing the wrong button. And I never realized how underwhelming a Sonic game can feel without the rumble. I tried playing it with the Wii Remote, but ultimately settled on the Wii Remote and Nunchuck combo. Now I'm fully into it. All right, the story. Tails and Sonic sneak into Eggman's interstellar amusement park full of cookies, palm trees, and sick one-liners. The theme park seems to be an apology for all of his past mistakes, but it may be a ruse as he's doing something completely different than he usually does, capturing tiny animals to power a machine. These wisps give Sonic special powers and Tails creates a translator to communicate with them. They find out that the wisps have been kidnapped by Eggman, so Sonic and Tails go to save the day. They do. The end. Sonic Color's plot wanted to bring Sonic back to his inception. Being a dick. Hey, where are you going? To find Baldy McNose Hair, of course. <laughs> I'm totally calling him McNose Hair. But this time, Tails is kind of a dick, too. As soon as they get there, Sonic thinks Eggman is up to no good, and Tails is like, nah, not this time, Sonic. Sonic's like Tails, you have no reason to believe that Eggman isn't up to no good. But then Sonic remembers that Tails is like eight and probably just wants to hang around a theme park. Sonic Color's plot serves the purpose to entertain the little ones. I'm not a little one, and I wasn't a little one when this game came out, so I feel like to comment on it too heavily may be a little dickish. That being said, here are my opinions. I appreciate the shift in tone, but the humor doesn't land with me. It's so brutally forced. All of the humor involves either one-liners and Sonic talking. Just talking for extended periods of time. Hey, did somebody here order a clobbering? Are you sure? It says somebody ordered an extra-large clobbering topped with everything. Hmm, okay. Tell you what, I can't take this thing back, so I'll give you an extra-large clobbering for nothing. Hope you're hungry. I feel like the writers kept writing stuff in hopes that something would just end up being funny, but it just feels like the script to that comedy film I wanted to make when I was 12. The reason why Eggman's amusement park is in space is because it's truthfully huge. Tropical Resort is both the entrance to the park and where all the hotels are. Sweet Mountain is made up of donuts and candy and chocolate and donuts. Mm. 
Starlight Carnival, which is full of neon lights, which I love, so good on you, Starlight Carnival. Here's a donut. Planet Wisp, which is the home planet of the Wisps. It's under construction, so Sonic better wear a hard hat. Aquarium Park, which is an Asian-themed water park, and Asteroid Coaster. Roller Coasters! Finally, there's Terminal Velocity, the incredibly easy, incredibly underwhelming final stage. Although the game takes a lot of cues from the Mario series, I am so thankful that they didn't Tropical Resort to using generic level themes like in the new Super Mario Bros. series. You know, the decade-old series, which is in major need of an update. This game still has an identity, and honestly, it's gorgeous. I really wish they'd do an HD update of this game because it's phenomenally gorgeous. But the resolution causes severe aliasing everywhere. I want to be able to appreciate what's there, so please make an HD port. Where fast-paced action and 2D platforming were hogging the attention in Sonic Unleashed, colors aimed to appeal to everyone. Therefore, power-ups and 2D platforming puzzles shift to be the focus. Speed segments are there, but unless they're the level's focus, they feel out of place and on rails. And most of the time, they're not the focus. The game strips Sonic of what makes him Sonic, but instead builds a solid 2D platforming experience. In Sonic Unleashed, I would often get disappointed when the perspective would switch from 2D after an awesome 3D segment. But here it's the opposite. A new, and in my opinion, very welcome addition to this game are the Wisps. I know a lot of people don't like the Wisps, and yeah, when they show up in later games they're annoying, but here, I really enjoy them. The game is very puzzly, and the Wisps really complement that. In the Wii version of the game, there are eight, okay, okay, aliens, all of which give Sonic different powers. Some of Sonic's abilities from past games are removed and given back as an alien. The spiky alien can do a spin dash, and this air balloon alien can light dash across rings. The white wisp seals Sonic. The white alien fills Sonic's boost gauge, and the rocket alien allows Sonic to turn into a rocket and fly the top of the stage. The drill alien turns Sonic into a drill, and the laser alien allows Sonic to turn into a laser and shoot around the stage like a pinball. The blue alien turns blue rings into blocks and blue blocks into rings, and Sonic into a cube. And finally, my favorite, the Frenzy Wisp. This turns Sonic into a scary-ass monster that eats everything and gets bigger as he does it. It's tough to control, but it's so ridiculous and fun that I don't even care. The Wisps. The w Wisps. The Wisps. The aliens add an extra layer to the game that was added specifically to compensate for the fact that Sonic was the only playable character. It works within the context, but I'm not clamoring for any more Wisps. One of my criticisms for every Sonic game since Sonic Heroes has been about the level length. When a level exceeds 10 minutes, it's frustrating to get a game over and have to start from the very beginning. It's a great way to waste time and a great way to force me to take sanity breaks while playing. Sonic Colors finally shortens level lengths. Each world is made up of six acts, but it could have easily been two acts. But instead of having each level drag on, Levels often surround a single theme or challenge, like using a specific kind of wisp or learning a specific level quirk. One introduced is this floating spring that will follow Sonic moving forward but not backwards. If you miss the spring, he'll fall and die. A more annoying one are these blocks which will move forward and backwards and knock Sonic off the stage which will cause him to fall and die. One of my biggest pet peeves in 2D platformers are 3D obstacles. Gaining a perspective on these and recognizing the patterns can be difficult because while you're moving on a 2D plane, they're moving separately from you. Some levels are designed specifically to teach you about these challenges and later they'll be combined to really test your skills. It's a slow introduction to a lot of these quirks and challenges, but later you'll be made to recall them. It's really the most traditional 2D platformer since Sonic 1. Despite being a really solid game, I easily look over Sonic Colors, but it's fun and unique within the library. Colors loses the identity that Sonic games have built over the years. It was designed to appeal to the Mario fanbase, and it's a fun platforming experience. But looking back on it, I'm a little underwhelmed. I think part of the reason why I overlook it is because I believed that I had forgotten a lot about this game. But while revisiting it, I realized that there was nothing in this game that I had forgotten. I just assumed that there was more to it. While playing Sonic Colors, it's fun, but now that I've made this video, my relationship with the game is over. It was fun entertainment with no positive or negative consequences. I really just hope Sonic Colors feels the same way about me. Colors kind of ignores the uniqueness of the Sonic brand. That being said, Sonic has always been a game that experiments, and getting too involved with itself could isolate newcomers. So to experiment with conformity as opposed to uniqueness isn't necessarily a bad thing. And at the time that this game came out, it's what the series needed. 2010 was seen as a renaissance for the series, and I do think Sonic Colors was the final piece needed 
To usher Sonic out of the Dark Ages, it returned the series to its true roots. Fun! Sonic Generations began as a tribute to the Sonic franchise, and it successfully continued that way up until it was done. The plan with Generations was to bring back remixed levels from every main series Sonic game. Sega conducted fan surveys to find out which zones were the most loved, but not only would old stages be remixed into 3D, but 3D stages would be remixed into a classic 2D. Two different playstyles featuring two different Sonics would be available. Sonic's classic design would be brought back for exclusively 2D levels. It was debated if classic Sonic should be given a voice. Jaleel White, the actor who played Urkel and nothing else, was the only option considered. He also played Sonic in three different animated series and another weird animated looking character in this Sonic the Hedgehog fan film. Ultimately, it was decided to keep Sonic mute for reasons unknown. The first trailer for Sonic Generations premiered at E3 2011, and the second one premiered about a few hours later. Ugh. I was on the edge of buying Sonic Generations when it came out. My Xbox was broken and I was sort of getting out of gaming at the time, so I didn't really want to jump through the hoops necessary to play this game. But this trailer changed my mind and forced me to jump through those hoops necessary to play the game. AKA I just asked my friend if I could borrow his PlayStation. Sonic the Hedgehog and My Chemical Romance defined my middle school years. Okay, the story. On Sonic's birthday, all of his friends, and even Cream the Rabbit, throw him a surprise party. An evil monster captures everyone, and Sonic discovers that time has been split apart. Another Sonic, Sonic, comes from the past to help Sonic run really fast to fix time. That's literally the explanation given in the game. From level to level, the Sonics rescue their friends and even Cream the Rabbit. Eggman gets captured and asks for their help, but soon they discover that Eggman, and another Eggman, Robotnik, were behind everything the whole time. They go super and through trial and error, they save the day. Sonic says bye to Sonic and promises that one day he'll be great like himself. Sonic, the end. Unlike Sonic Colors, there are no cringeworthy jokes burned into my mind, but there are little quips and references to the rest of the series. Totally strange. Well, no stranger than rescuing genies in magic books or saving aliens in an interstellar amusement park. It's nothing special and the story was just created to justify what happens in the game. My only substantial criticism of the story is of classic Sonic himself. Classic Sonic should be kind of a dick. Sonic was so heavily marketed as having an attitude in the early 1990s that it circled back around and became a little lame. I totally think that they should have given him a voice and differentiated Classic Sonic and Modern Sonic by old school ratitude and new school chill. Instead, they realized that Classic Sonic is kind of cute and walked with it. But they were actually running, it just looked like they were walking because Sonic is so fast. Every level in the game comes from another Sonic game. Between the bosses and levels, over 10 games are represented. I love every level selected, but what I don't like is that they focused more on picking the best level from each game, rather than levels that can come together to represent the whole series. There are no casinos, space, or mine-themed levels, which are all staples of the series. Instead, almost half of the stages are city-themed. I understand that these were considered the best levels from each game and isolated their awesome, but they don't come together well. The game opens up before the story starts, with Classic Sonic going through Green Hill Zone. Although stages feature one aesthetic, their layouts are completely redesigned to pay homage to multiple levels and offer something new. The corkscrew was never in the original Green Hill Zone, and Seaside Hill represents a ton of the water levels throughout the whole series, like Hydro City Zone and Labyrinth Zone. One of the highlights of the game are the remixed music tracks. I usually don't comment on music because it's not an area I'm really comfortable talking about, I just don't know a lot about music but the remix tracks are able to feel new, yet somehow really classic and nostalgic. Despite the fact that most of these levels come from 3D Sonic games, the 2D stages feel like classic 2D Sonic levels. Where the classic feeling is lost is with how classic Sonic controls. Something about him is off, I can't pinpoint it exactly, but I think it's because he feels heavier than in the original Sonic games. The originals were so fluid, never stopping. When going fast required active participation by jumping and spinning, the only thing 
thing coming between you and speed was your skill level and knowledge of the level itself. But here the fluid movement is missing. This time around, Sonic's a little bit more stiff when you go down in his ball. I can't articulate it exactly, but it's on the tip of my tongue. It doesn't feel bad, just wrong. I try jerking the controller to make it more fluid, but no matter how hard I try, it still feels stiff. Most of the game's levels come from 3D Sonic games, so after the first three levels, Classic Sonic takes a bit of a backseat to Modern Sonic. Every boss battle from here on out is a 3D boss battle, and every stage is a redesigned 3D stage. That being said, the later 2D levels start feeling more fresh because the closer and closer the game's referenced are to generations in the timeline, the more similar they feel to the original version. The most similar is Rooftop Run. Although I admit this is one of my favorite levels, it's not much different than Sonic Unleashed's version of it. I truly think that Generations has the highest quality of levels in the whole franchise. I don't think there is a single level in the mix I don't enjoy. But I do stand by what I said about a lack of diversity but it's all good and it never feels like a chore. Modern Sonic plays how he's played for the past several games, but here everything seems much more refined. Sonic's drift feature now has him turning into a ball and stages are explosive and more exciting than ever. However, the game isn't afraid to slow down for a moment, just a moment. This time around, it's more noticeable how slippery 3D platforming is, but that's just because the game actually tries to implement 3D platforming more. In heavier platforming segments, the game will still transition into 2D, which is fine and dandy, but it happens too much. Because of classic Sonic, I think that they should have limited the amount of 2D segments in modern Sonic's playstyle, but that probably just would have resulted in shorter levels, and speaking of short, this game. Sonic Generations' core game features only 9 levels, with 2 acts each, and level grinding isn't required to move forward in the story, so the game can easily be completed in under 4 hours. At first, I was kind of turned off by this, but this is actually in line with the length of older Sonic games, and actually, the real length of modern Sonic games too. Games like 06, Heroes, and Unleashed force you to replay levels over and over again to progress, and so much of its content is recycled. If you really enjoy the game, there are extra missions that you can do in each level. The extra missions act like both of the missions in Sonic Adventure 2, and the more bite-sized extra acts in Sonic Colors. If this game wasn't for you, they don't make a difference, but if you were like me, you may enjoy playing through every single mission. When this game came out, I was craving more Sonic Generations, and Sonic Generations satisfied that craving. A game shouldn't forcefully or artificially lengthen itself. Any extra content should be optional. If a game is bad and has extra side quests that you're forced to do, all it does is make the game feel arduous. But if the game is good, side quests are appreciated. The boss battles in this game are awesome, but it would have been cool to see some of the 3D boss battles in 2D and 2D boss battles in 3D. One, it would have been an additional way to remix the fight, and two, it would have given 2D Sonic more to do after the first three stages. Perfect Chaos in 2D would be oddly awesome, and the Eggwalker in 3D would have been weirdly cool. The remixed versions of the old bosses, however, are phenomenal. My favorite is Silver. Yes, they included the worst boss battle in the whole series, but they completely redefined how it's played, and it's awesome. Silver is finally that overpowered guy I wanted him to be. Mwah. The game ends with a final Super Sonic battle between Sonic, Sonic, and the Time Monster. It's awful. The perspective switches back and forth between Sonic and Sonic, and you can never tell what exactly you need to do to beat the Time Monster. It just eventually kind of happens after a completely confusing and frustrating fight. There's no final level leading into the boss, so the whole thing just kind of feels a little anticlimactic. Sonic Generations feels like a newly wrapped boutique version of the Sonic series, and it kind of is. It's a short game with phenomenal presentation, but it doesn't feel like a new entry in the series because it doesn't really have its own personality. So that's what it is, and that's why it's different from the rest of the series. But judging it as it is, it's fucking amazing. The game is so high energy, and because of its length, it's able to maintain that momentum throughout the entire game. Games need to have pacing because you can't go a straight 12 hours of just non-stop action and excitement. But when the game is shortened, it can pick up the energy and maintain it until the end. I know Sonic Generations isn't the big grand adventure that so many other Sonic games are, but it's the first Sonic game in a while to just focus on designing really good and solid levels. Sonic Generations wanted to celebrate this series, and with two Sonics, remix music, easter eggs, and returning to old locations, it does it really well. Sonic Generations is a love letter to the fans. 
And honestly, it's the best experience I've had playing a new Sonic game since I've had an adult brain. And for a moment, it felt like Sonic was finally back. Sonic Colors, Generations, and even Sonic 4 showed that the series still had promise. But when Sonic Lost World was announced in May of 2013, fans were excited to see a follow-up to Sonic Generations. My hopes were to see a brand new game with new locations and even more refined versions of what we saw in past 3D Sonic games. But as more and more details were released, I slowly lost confidence. Sonic Lost World scrapped the boost style of gameplay for something new. Mediocrity. Intense mediocrity. Sonic Lost World was created in collaboration with Sega and Nintendo, and while the game experimented with level design and new moves, it was an incredibly simplified experience with dull level themes and a more generic control layout for Sonic. Running is now an optional move that adds nothing to the game and is substituted by a rarely utilized parkour system. When Sonic Lost World was announced, I was really pumped to see what it would be like. But then, gameplay videos started surfacing. I was disappointed to see that Sega was once again ignoring what worked and trying something new. Though, I did remain optimistic. I actually bought the game day one, but I didn't play it till about a month later because of all the mediocre reviews I saw. Well, anyways, I popped it in and quickly gained no opinion on it. I had no reaction. I was genuinely underwhelmed. But all these years later, I think it's time to re-review Sonic Lost World, because let's be honest, that original video isn't my best work. But why have 38,000 people watched it? Don't go watch that video, go watch my Digimon video instead, it's much better. So the plot. Sonic and Tails are following Eggman as he captures tiny little animals. They end up tracking him down to a place called the Lost Hex. Tails seems to know a lot about it, but like the audience, Sonic doesn't care, so he doesn't ask. There, they find out that Eggman has taken a magic conch, which he controls the Zeddy, a group of... Zeddy, who live on the Lost Hex. Eggman sends them after Sonic, but then Sonic screws up and breaks the magic conch. The Zeddy turn on Eggman, and Eggman is forced to team up with Sonic to stop a doomsday device that Eggman created. But now, the Zeddy have control over the Magic Conch and the Doomsday Device because Sonic didn't believe in the power of the Magic Conch. The squad travels across the Lost Hex, beating Zeddy after Zeddy, until Tails gets captured. Eggman dies, and Sonic rescues Tails, beats the Zeddy, and then Eggman didn't die! Sonic beats up Eggman and deactivates the Doomsday Device. The end. My reaction? Nothing. The shell has spoken! This is the first time where this set of writers have had an opportunity to write a story involving multiple new characters. They had a chance to define the characteristics and personality of these characters, and they didn't do anything creative. To be fair, though, that may have been out of their control. But the final product is generic and stereotypical. You have Punk, Emo, Raphael, Elder, Fat, and Girl. Those are their characters, and those characters never stray away from that. The jokes don't work because of how uncreative the characters are. I know the punchline before it happens. Move it or lose it, Snow Cone! The last time we met, you ruined my nail art. Even the interaction between Sonic, Eggman, and Tails is bland. And it feels so forced. And that's because of how dialogue-heavy all of the cutscenes are. Tails starts becoming jealous of Eggman, but there's no reason for that to happen. Tails just sort of explains to Sonic that he's feeling jealous. And you don't trust me to do it! What? No! I trust you, Tails. It's just that- No, you don't. You trust Eggman more. You know how much that bites? But, like the past two entries, this was made for the little ones. So, who am I to judge? Well, I make videos on the internet, so it's kind of all I do. Sigh, everything seems so pointless. The first thing I noticed going into Lost World was Sonic himself. He's got his spin dash back, the figure eight animation is back, and all of his character animations are so bouncy and cartoony, I love it. He's a very appealing character to look at. Not like that. Then the next thing I noticed was the change gameplay style. 
So Sonic has now moved heavily away from a focus of speed to a more traditional platforming style. Sonic Colors tried to do this too, but kept the consistent gameplay style from Sonic Unleashed. Lost World kind of feels like it has the same philosophy, but a newly designed playstyle to fit that philosophy. Because Color used the boost gameplay style, it had a balance between puzzle platforming and speed, but they were clearly distinct. Sonic Lost World doesn't know what it's trying to do. The game tries its best by having Sonic's default speed be a walking cycle, only when pressing the right trigger will Sonic begin to run. Running also enables his parkour ability. The parkour ability allows Sonic to keep running even when he hits a wall or another object, he'll just kind of go up it or around it. This was a move added to replicate wall jumping and allow Sonic to keep his momentum. But the game isn't about maintaining momentum. Sonic's default speed is a walk cycle, and once you press the run button, he starts running at full speed. This was added to give the player more control over platforming segments. I get the desire to want to have Sonic's speed be controllable, but I think they went about it the wrong way. I would have much rather seen a button to make Sonic walk or more sensitive controls to control his speed. More than ever, this game feels like it's trying to conform to the ideas of a more traditional platformer. Sonic's a giant fucking conformist. In the first video of the series, I explained how Sonic uses memorization, trial, and error to challenge the player, where a series like Mario will lay out the challenges beforehand and test your skills and reaction time. When first introduced, the balance between 3D and 2D segments was used to balance fast action with more timed platforming, but there is no balance here. The 3D segments are just as slow and reliant on solving simple puzzles as the 2D segments are, like pushing fruit into a blender. Many levels have a theme or a gimmick, some of which work, and others are just as bland as the rest of the game, like pushing fruit into a blender. The ones that don't work are infinitely frustrating, and the ones that do copy it from somewhere else. Sonic Lost World's world is one that relies too heavily on past games, but instead of innovating on top of it, it created a generic version of the Sonic universe. There's familiar areas like Green Hill Zone and a casino, but after that you have Beach, forest, lava, snow, and clouds. There are memorable and unique moments sprinkled throughout the game, but they are far and few between. It's interesting to note that a goal with this game was to offer something new to the Sonic franchise. The visual themes are all recycled or generic themes picked up from, like, Microsoft clip art. But the actual layouts of the levels have never been seen in any Sonic game. Each level has a tubular or cylindrical design with a centralized gravity so Sonic can walk around the entire level. This helps create alternating level paths and new ways to experience the same level. Comparisons have been drawn to Mario Galaxy and even a cancelled Sonic game, Sonic Extreme. I like the tubular design. It's the only thing in this game that makes it unique. When I remember this game, the first thing I think of is the cylindrical levels, but before I replayed it for this review, I couldn't remember any specific moment or levels in the game itself, just the idea of the cylindrical levels. I think that says something positive about the concept itself, but not the execution. Nintendo is known for overusing the word new to repackage old ideas. It began with New Super Mario Bros, which was refreshing to see at first because it was the first new 2D Mario game since Super Mario World, but nearly a decade later, those games have begun to feel old and stale. Sonic Lost World is a stale recycled version of the Sonic franchise, just as my channel has become a stale recycled version of itself recently. The game features an overworld in a similar style to the Super Mario Bros. series, and like the Super Mario series, you have to collect certain things in the level to progress to later stages. Here, it's tiny little animals inside the robots. The first time I played through this game, I sucked at the minigame, so I had to grind enemies as I played. Having to go back and grind enemies for animals is a pain in the ass. One of the biggest complaints I've had with the whole series has been forced replayability. Sonic levels are usually short and fun, so you want to replay the levels anyways. But when a game like Sonic Lost World comes out, a game which isn't exciting, you don't want to replay it. So the game forces you to. When I first played this game, I had some criticisms that I didn't find to hold true anymore. I thought that the game didn't have enough focus and tried to be too many things, but now I see that it really didn't try to be anything. It wanted to try something new with the parkour system, but didn't utilize it in the right game. It wanted to surprise Sonic fans, but the method of doing that was to create an experience that stripped Sonic of Sonic. 
I said in my Sonic Colors review that the game experimented with conformity, but the caveat to that was with the fact that it blended itself with flavors of Sonic. You could cut out the whole story of Sonic Lost World and replace Sonic with any stock character and the game wouldn't drop in quality whatsoever. It would just be more true to itself. When Sonic Lost World came out, my consensus was essentially I have no strong feelings one way or the other. And that's still how I feel. There's nothing special about this game, and the way it experimented, it didn't belong in the game itself. Sonic Lost World is a game that I know I will never revisit. However, it's a game that the fanbase has latched onto, mainly because of the PC port, which has resulted in some crazy mods, which has given an interesting twist to this once bland game. So it's not completely irredeemable, it just took the initiative of creative fans to make it worth it. And it looks like Sega has caught on to that trend. Later in 2017, Sonic Mania is coming out. The creative team behind that game were fans who created fan games of Sonic the Hedgehog. Keep creating and keep loving the character. The Sonic the Hedgehog series has had its ups and its downs and its deeper downs. But there is a reason why the character is still around, and that is because of the fanbase. For whatever reason, Sonic has been a character that has resonated with people. Although it's been a chore to get through some of these games, I'm much more optimistic looking at the series as a whole. When I started this project, I was incredibly cynical, but as I moved through it, I have not only become more appreciative of the quirks and experimentation the series has shown, but I've also learned how to talk about media better. I'm still going to talk about Sonic. After all, there are tons of spin-offs and TV shows and media related to the character that I haven't gotten to. But for now, I want to open the door to talk about some other things, too. So, until next time, Sonic. If you made it this far, congratulations. If you want to subscribe and see more of my content, please consider doing that. Also, if you want to stay up to date with what I'm doing, consider following me on Twitter and my blog on Tumblr. Other than that, thank you for watching. I'll put up another video if you want to watch more of my stuff after three hours.